Hey everybody, for this podcast, I'm lucky enough to be joined by researcher, writer, and multi-talented artist David Metcalf, and a gentleman I'm lucky enough to call a buddy. We've had about a dozen conversations in the past year, and it wasn't uncharacteristic for those conversations to last for upwards of four hours, which my friends and family can both testify to. We've met only once, and that was for a talk at the observatory where we hung out with George Hansen who is uh, professionally employed in parapsychology laboratories for eight years. Uh, three years at the Rhine Research Center and five at the Psychophysical Research Laboratories in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, so we've been wanting to record one of these and now we have something to go on, which is Santa Muerte. And the reason why I want to talk about this right now is because I was totally aware that you were studying Santa Muerte but I didn't get it at all until literally about 7 or 8 o'clock last night. <laughs> Which led to hours and hours of reading and research, as well as several texts to you. And then I did a little thought experiment with Santa Muerte, uh, which we'll talk about later because I'm sure you did one as well. <laughs> but I wanted to talk to you now before I had time to really think about it and draw conclusions because I realized that's part of the magic of Santa Muerte is how it enters your consciousness because we're really going to be having a conversation about death tonight and I come from a lineage of southern funeral directors so it's part of my upbringing and uh, David had a brilliant idea for a kind of corporate death therapy service where a CEO is placed in a casket which was something we talked about the second or third time we ever talked about anything. But nevertheless, the conversation tonight is going to be about death and uh, specifically Santa Muerte. So, David, you're doing right work right now with another scholar, a very serious scholar named R. Andrew Chestnut, who's an author and a Ph.D., and I think he's a chair of Catholic Studies somewhere? Yeah, he's a chair of Catholic Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, so... He's, uh, he's kind of the leading scholar, definitely the leading scholar in English on Santa Muerte. And um, in looking at some of the, the Spanish language stuff as well, I would say that his scholarship um, stands up to anything that's going on, you know, on the ground in Mexico. So, Wow. And are you guys, you guys have done an article together on HuffPo, and you're, uh, are you both working on um, that website, Skeleton Saint, is it? Yeah, we're we're collaborating on the research, and uh, Andrew's working on a a new book. Um, his first book, devoted to death. Well, not his first book, but his first book on Santa Muerte, um, devoted to death, just got translated into Spanish and published in Mexico City. Um, so he's now uh, he's now working on a second one. Um, and we're kind of collaborating on the research for that. So, so you guys are like the Santa Muerte gringos in North America right now. Yeah, it's kind of strange. Um, when I first encountered Santa Muerte, I think it was 2005, and uh, I was actually working at a marketing agency and was kind of given carte blanche to uh, just research trends and that kind of thing, do trend spotting. And uh, Santa Muerte was one of the things that popped up because um, that was about when I think the mainstream media really caught hold of the fact that there were people in Mexico and coming into the United States that, um, you know, were paying devotion to a, a female Grim Reapress, um, which was kind of shocking to the American media because it wasn't, it's interesting the way the, the devotions have kind of developed and the traditions developed because it's been kind of an underground tradition for uh, decades. Um, and it actually, you know, in some ways goes back hundreds of years. So uh, when, in 2001, when Dona Cata made the first uh, public shrine in Tepito, uh, which is a barrio in Mexico, um, when she brought the first public shrine forward, the devotional system was already, you know, somewhat developed. Um, so when it reached the U.S. media, it was kind of like the, you know, this underground tradition that had been going on in Mexico and you know parts of LA and parts of the United States where there was a, a large Latino population um, that you know it was kind of fully formed so when the the media got a hold of it you know here's all these people paying devotion to this Grim Reaper figure and it kind of blew the minds of a lot of people including myself when I first saw the news stories but I never thought 
you know, a tradition from Mexico City and some of the most uh, violent neighborhoods in that was going to be something that I have an opportunity to look into. Um, but when Andrew did his when Andrew's book got published, I jumped right on it to get an interview with him. And uh, since I'd been studying it, you know, on my own, uh, we got into a good conversation. And since then, um, we co-presented at uh, Morbid Anatomy Library um, on a talk of probably one of the first lectures um, outside of Andrew's uh, on Santa Muerte. And then, you know, we've kind of grown into a sort of collaborative research thing where we, uh, you know, share information on that. So it's definitely been interesting. Now, there's a bunch of places we could go to right there, but before we go there, one thing I'd like to bring up is the only other people probably lecturing in the United States about Santa Muerte are law enforcement officials. Yeah, that's that's right. That's a good, yeah, that's a good call. Yep. Yeah, uh, uh, please. Specifically, uh, U.S. Marshal uh, Robert Del Monte, uh, he, uh, he's been going around, I think, for quite a while doing law enforcement um, seminars and that, trying to get people aware of Santa Muerte. Um, uh, it, you know, and it, it's contentious too because El Monte, uh, you know, at first I saw what, he, I saw the information that he was presenting and I was kind of offended by it. Mm -hmm. um, but with the recent Catholic uh, clarifications on their uh, um, condemnation of the tradition, mm -hmm. in looking back on what El Monte was saying, um, he's unique in the fact that he doesn't give a blanket condemnation of all Santa Muerte's followers and actually tries as best he can within the um, auspices of being a, you know, fairly average, you know, guy and plus being a U.S. Marshal, you know, he tries to be neutral with it. So um, it seems to me more, you know, looking at it and kind of giving him the benefit of the doubt, it seems that he's just confused over this tradition, which suddenly has become part of his job, you know, to deal with what he sees as a death cult. Know, coming out of Mexico. So you can imagine a U.S. Marshal in that position is probably a bit confused and concerned, you know, um, compared to some of the stuff coming out from uh, folks like um, Bishop Pfeiffer, uh, who's a bishop in Texas, um, who just flat out says Santa Muerte is satanic and diabolical. Um, the stuff that El Monte's saying seems to be a little bit more open-minded you know, within the context of what, what he can say, you know, being a law enforcement official. Well, that's, that's something I was really, really curious about because um, it is, the situation is so intense, um, no matter where you look at what angle you look at this thing from, it's escalating, it's, it's really intense. I mean, the situation is as hardcore as it can get because there's this oppressive element that's developed. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, the bishops now who are coming out against it. I saw a clip of Alex Jones, uh, who is, you know, of course, like <laughs> characteristically hysterical and just saying, it's diabolical, folks. It's utterly diabolical. And the <laughs> only thing that could, like, come to mind, of course, was like, well, how many years are we away from a representative of Santa Muerte being on, you know, Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman and Juan Gonzalez saying, no, no, this isn't just a narco <laughs> saint, folks. This is, like, a really important part of, like, uh, contemporary religious development that's happening right now. So that was something, because there is this oppressive, like, okay, so before we get into really what Santa Muerte is, let's talk about the, the like, oppressive uh, energies around it, because, of course, we have... Uh, in 2009, 40 or so altars to Santa Muerte was destroyed on the Mexican border by the Mexican government. From uh, And this is something I heard from your colleague, how it's just the whole thing is being ravaged, you know, by the bishops, government officials, um, and that it's 40% uh, of the prison population. But then again, from what I understand now, 10 has 10 million followers, so of course you're going to have criminal elements when you have 10 million followers. Uh, but could we go into that? Could you tell me about this, This uh, how it's being repressed from all angles? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, obviously it's a very complicated uh, situation. And when we're talking about 
um, when we're talking about the different groups, I think one of the things that I found is that it's really important to to step into their shoes, mm -hmm. which, funny enough, is a, a lesson from Santa Muerte's neutrality. You know, because she has she has devotees who are prison guards, who are policemen, and so we'll take. I mean, taking it from the law enforcement, uh, you know. Uh, drug cartel, narco saint kind of angle. Um, she's got devotees on both sides of the, the you know, kind of war. And um, so there's the policemen who, I mean, I think there's, there's one uh, district in Mexico where the policemen actually have uh, patches of Santa Muerte on their uniforms as kind of like a, you know, a, a protection charm. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's not really. It's not as black and white as it may appear in the media. Right. And so, you know, every every group that's kind of getting involved in this, on the on the end of trying to uh, figure out what Santa Muerte is, and you know, either uh, kind of sound a word of caution or you know, actively stop the the devotions. Um, all those groups, you know, it's it's just really desperately important to understand them as well. You know, because. Um, with the police, like I said, there's policemen who are Santa Muerte devotees, you know, and who see it, you know, one way. With the police who are trying to stop it, a lot of what they're looking at is you have a decentralized faith tradition whose main symbol is a Grim Reaper. Right. Now, when you have that situation, and you also have, uh, you know, cartels who are decapitating people, skinning people alive, uh, posting public executions on uh, YouTube, you know, I mean, when you have that kind of situation and you've got this iconography which has no control over it and whose basic, you know, element is a symbol of death, um, that's pretty scary to the law enforcement and justice officials because, um, you know, if you look at the potentials behind that iconography for spurring violence, it's huge. You've already got situations where um, there was one family who was, uh, you know, giving blood ritual by killing people in front of their altar. Um, you know, there's rumors of something called a blood baptism where, uh, you know, the um, gang member or whatever is baptized into the, the Santa Muerte devotions by killing someone and then wearing their skin. Jeez. What, you know, and whether or not that's true... When you see people being decapitated and you know by cartels and probably by corrupt police as well, um, when you're living in that kind of confusion and then suddenly you've got this, uh, like I said, decentralized uh, faith tradition whose main figure is a figure of death, um, that causes <laughs> you know that's just some concern and alarm uh, <laughs> to, to try to stop that, you know, and so. And from that, you know, from that angle, I, I can see where where they're coming from. But at the same time, when you're not in that position, when you're not a law enforcement official, you know, and when you're simply looking at their tradition as it is in reality, the you know, like you said, the numbers of uh, her devotees and then are not they're not criminals, mm -hmm. you know. And and if you look at where she's active, if you have a faith tradition in largely impoverished areas which grew out of people's relationship to poverty, their relationship to, you know, uh, corrupt uh, official groups, whether it's the church or the state, um, you know, or neighbors who are violent or whatever. Um, you know, when you're, when you're looking at that from the outside, you realize that, okay, so a guy gets arrested with uh, a tattoo of Santa Muerte and he happens to be, you know, uh, a contract killer. Well, he's got a mother. And he's got a father, and he may have brothers and sisters. He's got cousins, aunts, uncles, and all that. They may be devotees too. Are you going to claim that they're because they're in a in a environment that has these elements of violence to it? Are you going to say that they're all criminals? You know, and and so you get into this question of uh, where does where does criminality spawn from? Which I think is something really valu valuable with looking at the tradition neutrally. You start to see a different a different aspect of criminality than we're normally presented with this black and white, like, you know, criminal, not criminal, uh, you know, criminal environment, not criminal environment. There's, you start to develop a nuance by, through the lens of Santa Muerte, you know. And then with the church, you've got a situation where she just simply doesn't fit in with uh, church doctrine, mm. period. The, the theology of the Catholic Church could never 
uh, include Santa Muerte as she is um, in her current tradition. So, um, you know, what was brought up in the, the Mexican, the Conference of Mexican Bishops uh, clarification is the fact that uh, she's not a person. Um, something that, that comes as a surprise to folks in the U.S. who are used to, you know, concepts of gods, goddesses, paganism, uh, you know, pagan gods, the way that that kind of stuff all plays out in uh, the faith traditions that most people in the U.S. are familiar with. Um, Santa Muerte is very much death itself. And all her devotees will say that, that, you know, this isn't a goddess of death or whatever. This is death. Um, you know, and so within that context, she can't be sanctified. Um, Santa Muerte translates as Saint Death. That's its most accurate translation. And uh, so within Catholic theology, um, only persons, you know, only people can be, who were flesh and blood and actually living, uh, can be sanctified. So um, right there, Santa Muerte can't be a part of the Catholic Church. Um, you know, and so... I, with and then with the, so with the Catholic issue, I think what comes in then is a question of, you know, the excessive focus on Satanism and uh, you know devil worship claims. Um, to with again within Catholic theology, Christ defeated death. So, and the figure representing death uh, becomes Satan. Because, you know, in the, the fall, what's the, what's the fall is the introduction of death into the Garden of Eden and the expulsion of man and woman. And so, you know, Satan as the tempter and that kind of thing, uh, Satan, you know, brings death into the world. So within that definition, again, uh, Santa Muerte would be technically a satanic religion um, within the Catholic theology. So, you know, the Catholic Church's reaction uh, is you know pretty much just based on the doctrine. There's not much else that they can do, um, other than condemn it, you know, and make sure people recognize that this is not Catholic theology that's going on, you know. With all that said, the tradition itself, again, when you're not Catholic and you're just looking at it from the tradition, uh, is much different than the picture painted by uh, the Catholic Church. There's a couple of places we could go right there. Let me start from uh, the beginning where you were talking about the law enforcement's involvement with Santa Muerte and the iconography thereof. Um, because uh, uh, Andrew Chestnut mentioned that when he was down in the uh, the Mecca, if you will, of Santa Muerte, which is, what's the name of that area? Um, when he was in Tepito? I think, yeah, I think it was Tepito. He was in Tepito and he came across a lawyer and he said the lawyer um, was uh, saved from his kidnappers by Santa Muerte. So even even the lawyers, right, 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 and that you know there's a there's a specific um, candle color for justice, which can be used by lawyers to uh, not just color. I'm sorry, I can't a color association because um, it could be a statue. It can be you know any ways that you would color in a ritual, but a color association specifically for justice. Which again can be used by lawyers, judges, uh, prosec you know, people who are being prosecuted, or defendants. So her neutrality really plays into this fact that anyone in a profession where they're dealing with, you know, they're struggling with some kind of difficulty or whatever, uh, depending on the level of that difficulty and you know their personal beliefs, Santa Muerte can be something that they go to. Now I know we haven't really gone into what Santa Muerte is yet. But there's one last thing I'd like to go into before we do, and that is how it started spawning in Mexico. Because it started as an esoteric club, that it started with a small group of elites, in the sense of that they were like celebrities or something like that. In other words, they, they probably, had, but there was also a woman, from what I understand, the, uh, I think it's the Romeo family down there who's, who's been uh, worshiping or being yes. a devotee for 57 years, but prior to yes. that... That's Dona Keita, yeah. Oh, Dona, okay. Um, but prior to that, it was part of, like, the upper echelon of society, and yet now it's this street folk religion that is stretches from Chile to Canada. Right. And, well, and the, the, the elite thing is a rumor. Uh, uh, 
there's a, a I forget if he's a journalist or a writer, but he wrote uh, a fictionalized account which he claimed was based on real facts. Oh, about um, the thing. I mean, presumably, I suppose he's a trustworthy source, but he did write it as fiction, and there is uh, that's not a not a proven claim. That would definitely be like a hearsay kind of thing. But it, looking at um, you know where her tradition did come out of. Uh, in the 1940s, it was written about in terms of love magic, um, and there, you know, the there was a specific novena, uh, you know, a series of prayers that went along with this love spell that was associated with Santa Muerte. So, um, within the context of uh, Mexican culture, where uh, folk magic has had a lot more strength over the years. Um, I could definitely see, you know, because it's focused on love magic and that, that could definitely start to attract, you know, every level of society. All right. Well, then let's talk about now what is Santa Muerte? Because I guess everyone deserves to hear it now. <laughs> well, it's, it's uh, death. I mean, that's uh, Dona Keita. Uh, there's a... Uh, a good short documentary on Monster TV, um, which is on YouTube, um, where Donicate is quoted as, you know, essentially just, it is death. You know, that there's no, no goddess, it's not a god. Um, the reason that devotees can say uh, that Santa Morte is second only to God is that she is quite literally the thing that uh, ends everything. Um, yeah, I mean, it's that she is the, she's death, I don't know, you know, she's the, the transition point for everything. So the thing that makes things partiality, you know, if you think about uh, God as a whole, and then what splits that up into things that are individual, you know, parts, uh, she's that force. So she is, uh, to her devotees, is literally, you know, second only to God. She's the thing that makes reality possible. She is death. When we talk about Santa Muerte, Saint, Death, and all these like wonderful nicknames. I think you probably know them off the top of your head better than I do. What are some of them? La Flaca and La Nina Blanca. Uh, the Godmother. Yeah, La Madrina. Is, that's one of my favorite ones. Yeah, I like I, that one. I think that defines uh, her practical work very well. You know, if you think in terms of a Godmother, and also kind of points to that second only to God thing. Mm. Because if you think what what the function of a godmother or a godfather is within Catholicism, it's to guide the you know, the kid up into God, to introduce them to God, you know, and, and that holy relationship. And then if you look at the way that her devotees talk about her, that's exactly what her relationship is to them. You know, they they feel that when they die, they pass through Santa Muerte to go to God. You know, so she's the the last thing that happens. And in some sense, you know, when they're born, they go from non-existence to existence. So their state in non-existence dies, and then they're born. And so she becomes this very complex, uh, you know, figure who's there at birth and death. And, um, you know, is basically the godmother to their existence. It made, when I really started getting into it, I realized it as a kind of guardian angel figure that is always present with life. I mean, in the room with you. And that's something I want to get into you, I mean, with you later is the uh, death anxiety and the fact that, you know, not just ourselves, but many other creatures on the planet understand death and death anxiety. Um, elephants, of course, mourn, and uh, there is these... Uh, wonderful photographs that were circulating online for a while of a tiny bird, I think a sparrow, mourning um, another dead sparrow. And it was like really intense, very touching sort of photograph because it was kind of an undeniable image. It was a series of images. Um, so this is like a real thing that, that we're all conscious of. And here we have this, I mean, let's, let's say cult, because even they call it a cult, the culto. Uh, that is focused on this presence that is death for life. In other words, like death is unavoidable for living things. It is always in the room with you. And 
There is at one end of us a biological need to keep death away so we survive, but then as uh, higher life forms, we of course are well aware that uh, the trend is for us to eventually die, to meet her, to meet the holy death, the Santa Muerte. That's, that's an inevitability. Um, you know, medical science has yet to take us beyond it, and then even if it did, well, how do you know if a star is not going to explode in your neighborhood or whatever? But <laughs> <laughs> that kind of idea that death, Santa Muerte, as a kind of guardian angel figure. What do you, got any comments there? Yeah, and that's that what you uh, what you had said. You know, uh, one of her names, uh, La Santísima Muerte, means uh, most holy death. And so, if you think about that, I mean, that right there is at the at the relationship level that people come to her as is the most holy death. So it's it's that transition that's holy, you know. And what's really interesting, I think, in terms of uh, you know the her ties to criminality in that is that as a neutral figure, neutral because she is literally death and there's no emotion in death and there's no uh, choice in death and there's no deviation in death um, and so she doesn't have you know there's com it's, it's just a complete true neutrality almost a, a non-existence to it um, because of that the the criminal element really comes under the judgment of Santa Muerte when they die so if you think about, you know, a contract killer, they may pray to her to, you know, have a successful hit or to stay away from being caught in that. But at the end of the day, when they get caught and they're punished, they're often punished by another devotee of Santa Muerte <laughs> in a completely neutral sense of this is justice. And that, um, you know, there's a, a kind of folk Catholic tradition of the saint of the good thief. Um, which was uh, at times fostered by the Franciscan order. Um, and the, you know, the good thief is the one who, when Christ is crucified, there's two thieves, one of whom uh, basically says, you know, well, if, you're, if you are who you say you are, uh, let's get off the cross. You know, like, let's, let's stop this and, you know, prove that you truly are what you, what you are and who you say you are. And then the other thief says, you know, well, you know, basically to the, the first thief, shut up, we're, uh, you know, we're guilty of a crime, this man isn't, you know, why would, you, why would you say that? We're guilty and we're being punished justly, he's not, you know, and then says, you know, like, basically I believe in what you're saying, and Christ says, well, then you'll be with me in paradise. Now, theologically, that's a really, really important fact, that you have a moment where there's two thieves, both of whom are guilty, one of whom says, I'm guilty, let me out of my punishment. The other one says, I'm guilty, and I'm being punished justly, but I have con compassion for you. And he becomes the first saint. He becomes the first sanctified figure in Christ's resurrection. Because Christ says, you know, you'll be with me, you know, you'll be with me in heaven. So there's no, you know, this is, this is a thief. <laughs> you know, this isn't like, a repentant person on their deathbed or something like that, he doesn't repent really. He says, I'm guilty. Yeah, I'm guilty and I did what I did and I don't regret it and I'm being punished justly, but I believe who you are. And Christ says, okay, well, come with me to heaven, you know, because you've gotten it. You got the, you got what it is. And that's the, I think that's really one of the central ideas behind this, the way that the Santa Muerte devotees feel about the idea of the most holy death. You know, so you have gunmen, you've got drug dealers, you've got rapists, you've got kidnappers, you've got smugglers, you know, the whole gamut of whatever illegal activity um, propitiating her. But in the end, they all come under judgment. And it's exactly because of that death anxiety. If you listen to a lot of what they say, you know, the more violent the person is in that, the more fearful they are of Santa Muerte. And the more that they feel that they've got to give in order to hold back Santa Muerte's justice. So, you know, one of the interesting things about uh, Bishop Pfeiffer, who I mentioned earlier, he's starting a ministry um, to basically, I don't think he would call it exorcism, but uh, to help guide uh, Santa Martistas out of the tradition that they're stuck in this cycle. Well, a lot of the people that he's going to be dealing with are probably the people that feel guilty for something that they've petitioned for, you know, and have and therefore feel, you know, he's getting this report back that she's evil and oppressing their life. 
um, what they're really what's really happening is they're coming under their own guilt, you know, and that's part of the function of Santa Muerte. So there's this, it, you know, at every level of the the tradition, there's these amazing complexities that you get into that really expose interesting uh, interesting existential questions and interesting ways to look at how people deal with stuff, you know, and, and how people react to their own emotions or their own thoughts or their own feelings and urges. You know, it's it's really fascinating. That's that's the other thing is we should we should get into how Santa Muerte functions on a daily level, on a practical level, because the thing that really got me like despite all the the just the fascinating aspects of it historically and contemporaneously. Um, seeing its effect applied to practical magic, okay, and, you know, we can talk later about, you know, what do we mean by magic and stuff, because I know you and I have kind of fringy takes on it, even for people who practice <laughs> magic, right? <laughs> so, um, to see that, well, first you have the whole, um, I guess I... Latin American thing, which is like magic, magic oriented, whether it's, you know, Santeria or praying to saints or, you know, various kinds of hoodoo and whatnot, is that it's a very active spiritual community where you have people playing it out, saying prayers, do three heavenly fathers, etc. It's, it's a very, it's oh, a very... Just, that's you mentioned three heavenly fathers. I just want to jump in real quick because the, the three heavenly fathers thing is, that's like, you that's that's when you really get into the true folk traditions like three our fathers would be the easiest thing that you would do i mean i've read accounts of uh nine night vigils where you're fasting and staying up until five in the morning doing prayers and the prayer recommendations are i mean they're intense so you know we see this kind of like popular end of things where the people who will talk to the press or you know go to the newspaper and they get interviewed um, that's usually not the far extent of it. You know, the far extent of it is some pretty uh, impressive feats of, you know, fasting, meditation, focus, and prayer um, for ostensibly practical ends, you know. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons why that is, um, which is, I guess, we, we should really get into why it's so efficacious and... Um, you know, uh, why it has such a strong effect as a, an icon, because I'm kind of like on the fence with icons. In fact, one of the reasons why we're having this conversation is because I have never been blown away by iconography in my life until I encountered this and like really soaked it up for a second and realized why there would even be 40 altars by the border and why the commercial sales of Santa Muerte paraphernalia are so high in North America and Central America is because it is it when you look at it as an object you know the reason why I think I wasn't interested in it at first is because it was just alien and then it was aversion like you have the aversion because it's a skeletal figure of course and then when you get into the actual presence of the thing and then it's nature with the wish granting and trying to ensure one has a good death by granting these wishes. And of course, if you ask for the wrong thing, well, then the onus is on you. Um, I think that really plays into the it's the spread of this thing is because the uh, the the image, the idol, uh, the representation is extraordinarily potent. Yeah, and very complex too. I mean, the 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 amount of information that can be packed into uh, the the different names, the the different color associations, the different objects that are associated with the statue, it's it's amazing because, like you said, I mean, it's a it's a skeletal figure, and that's basically it. So it's at one time really really simple, um, and at the same time able to hold this complexity that's insane. You know, I mean, if you look at the uh, some of the altars, I mean, there's like hundreds of statues, all of them different, all of them a different book, essentially, on understanding death mm -hmm. um, and understanding that relationship, but also understanding life because of the intimate association of life and death. You know, I mean, so you have, I mean, it, yeah, it's astounding. I'm, I'm kind of speechless by, you know, because I've just been... Uh, I just did that that piece on the clarification, so I've been looking at a lot of the altar pictures and stuff, and it really is intense. 
you know, and then the, the other thing that's interesting too with the icons, um, there's the apparitions. They have, uh, there's, a, there's an apparition tradition um, of, you know, the same kind of thing of people seeing like Christ on the side of a building in the water and stuff like that. Right. Or the Virgin Mary. There's Santa Muerte apparitions. Um, and so I've got a, um, this guy, Martin George, publishes a, a book called Devotion, uh, Devotion of Santa Muerte, or Devotion to Santa Muerte magazine. And uh, the, uh, there's a whole issue that's dedicated to these apparitions. And it was really funny because I was up in Brooklyn um, to, do, uh, to present the co-host a couple talks at the observatory. And um, in my friend Shannon's building, right, right at the right at the front, there was like a boot scuff mark or something like that. <laughs> and sure enough, it was you know I mean you, when you have a, something as simple as a skeletal figure in a cloak, a lot of things are going to look like that. So this boot scuff was essentially you know a, a Santa Muerte apparition. It looked just like a, a Grim Reaper figure. So you know the, the like <laughs> they're going to encounter this this stuff everywhere. You know, Walmart sells t-shirts uh, right now. You can go into the t-shirt section. They're in those little spin rack things. <laughs> they're, they're the same images, literally the same images that are being used in Mexico, except for in Mexico, they have like a glittery Santa Muerte font on them. And here they don't have that. It's just the, the Grim Reaper figure, but it's the exact same image. The ones in Mexico are actually a little bit, uh, better print jobs, but the ones, uh, you know, and they're still kind of black market images that are ripped off of other things. I mean, um, but, Mar you know, Walmart is selling the same image. It's like you walk into Walmart, Santa Muerte is there. She just doesn't have a label on her, you know, and, but she's sitting there, you know, in the t-shirt rack and some kids picking that up, you know, and going home and going to church the next day or whatever. And at the same time, has Santa Muerte in his closet, you know, it's just not named yet. But then if he encounters Santa Muerte anywhere on the news or whatever, and that image pops up, you know, there's, you know, they that person has that shirt or they walk into Walmart and they realize, oh, you know, this isn't, it's not labeled as Santa Muerte, but she's sitting right here, you know, which to me, I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> and so the way, and then on the, on the other end of it, going down into, uh, you know, Mexico City and that. The ability to repropriate, you know, and, and to take these images, which, you know, taking like a, like a Halloween album cover and turning it into a devotional image, you know, like hair metal and stuff like that from the 80s with these Grim Reaper figures, uh, ripping that, that picture off and then, you know, writing Santa Muerte on it or putting, you know, printing a Santa Muerte kind of logo thing on it, it suddenly becomes a devotional object. And no less legitimate than, you know, any other devotional object in the tradition. And again, you know, that to me, that's amazing. You, it's it, you turning everyday objects, just, you know, regular images that, you know, people think are kitschy or cliche or whatever. And suddenly it becomes this incredibly potent thing, which is scaring law enforcement officers, making the Catholic Church, uh, you know, have to really clarify its doctrine and, you know, causing people to be excited over a satanic scare, you know, but it's from this idea of a uh, relationship with death that can be focused through Walmart t-shirts. That it's just amazing. That was really funny. I have to I have to like apologize to everyone in advance because of the recording. I have to hold back my laughter because it might screw up the feeds between David and I cuz I think when we talk at the same time um the feed gets a little screwed up, so I have to hold back my laughter, because usually I just laugh in his face when he does the kind of talk that he does right now. Because he's always talking about, like, they're selling mind science at Walmart, dude. You want to do, like, a real tangent, like, a real quick side tangent? Because Walmart is the nexus yeah, for, that is like, occult nonsense. Let's hear it real quick. Well, I, yeah, you see, now you're, you got me into it. You drew me into it. The, the Walmart sells exorcism books. They sell books on exorcism that... I mean, it's the, on every street corner in America, they're, you know, the most uh, just generic distribution hub of, you know, regular everyday daily garbage. And they sell books on exorcism that are effective, that if you go back and you look at the, the exorcist traditions, or if you look at any of the stuff being published, you know, as a grimoire or whatever, 
they're essentially using the same like psycho spiritual social technology um, in these books that are available at Walmart. It's it's amazing. In the in the uh, another comment you made uh, was the the mind science that there's a Christian mind science pop daytime TV publications there as well, right? Yeah, well, that's the yeah. I mean, a lot of the stuff that they're that they're pushing as Christianity in this it's it's part of the New Apostolic Reformation movement, but it's essentially mind science. I mean, it's positive thinking, the prosperity gospel stuff. That's all Napoleon Hill. You know, they've just slapped Jesus in it and, you know, kind of thrown some biblical quotes in that, which actually, in a way, again, it turns it back to kind of magic. You know, it's mind science plus biblical quotes, and you're essentially getting back into 19th century magic. You know, so uh, go to your local Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> as long as, you know, as long as you can kind of get past the veil of uh, offensive um, prosperity gospel Christianity, you can... X to some pretty potent, you know, spiritual technology there. <laughs> Great, thank you. Walmart, home of American sorcerers. It's awesome. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Um, so uh, let's let's get back into it. it was this uh, the um, so back to Santa Muerte here? Um, so the the two thing, well, t two of the things I really wanted to talk about right here was the practical application because she is a she is not a, she's not just white she's not just black she's not just red she's a full spectrum agent if you wish she's a rainbow which uh, from what I understand came in from Cuba um, and the uh, the uh, so I wanted to talk about as a as a practical magical system and then on the other side I wanted to talk about well, I guess you know, and we'll save it for later. Like what we mean by magic at the at the end of this, because I don't really want to go on that tangent now. I really want to talk about Santa Muerte now, and uh, the other end of the figure, because what hap and, and no, uh, uh, her nature. Pardon me, not the figure, but her nature, because this this is the the shift that I was surprised by and attracted to. Because at first I was like, man, David's just into skeletons, man. He's just in this grim reaper stuff, but then. <laughs> Then when I looked at it, where she's this loving, uh, watchful, maternal, uh, wish-granting, will grant you anything you ask for, almost like a parent, um, you know, who will save you from kidnappers. So she's a she's a, a goodly, loving, big, uh, pseudo-female uh, death, and um, how how that how. I mean, and Mike. The, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm having the call because when I imagined that presence, I was like, okay, let's imagine this as a presence. Uh, the, there was truly like a release of tension in my chest that I is this characteristic of my person, and that I have never had with any other imaginary device that I've employed. You know, like I mean, everyone like involved in magic likes to play with. You know tulpas and veves and sigils and you know basically also imaginary devices and visualization tools and mantras and things like that I've never had the kind of alleviation that I got from this icon I think it tied very close to the existential problem of death and generally fearing death and also the male interpretation of death which we'll get into a little later and the differences between you know the standard Grim Reaper and um, Santa Muerte, but before we go there, let's talk about it. Let's talk about her as this, as this magical operating system. Yeah, she's uh, is known in uh, in Mexico as basically the most efficacious miracle worker. A lot of the the conversion stories from Catholicism to uh, to you know the Santa Muerte devotions are based on the fact that people will say. They petitioned the Virgin of Guadalupe and didn't, you know, really get what they wanted. They did St. Jude, didn't really get what they wanted. <coughs> and, uh, you know, they pursued all the legitimate saints. And finally, uh, they turned to Santa Muerte, and that was when their prayer was granted. So uh, she's got this reputation for being, you know, essentially, like you said, uh, just a master of patroness of, you know, people's needs across the board, whatever it is, whatever you want, whatever you need, 
um, if you're willing to come to her. And that's actually, there's something, uh, <coughs> there's similar traditions um, in Gauchito Gil, who's a, a folk saint in um, South America, uh, but he, he uh, his sanctification on the folk level came from him being kind of a Robin Hood figure who uh, the policeman who murdered him or who killed him after capturing him uh, he before he was killed he said uh, you know, he told the policeman your son is sick or your kid's sick when you get back to the village um, if you pray to me I will heal him so uh, the policeman proceeds to kill Gauchito Gil uh, by slitting his throat while he's hanging upside down, bleeds him out, you know, like a pig, basically, kills him like a pig, uh, goes home, not re doesn't really think about it. When he gets home, his kid's sick. And so he immediately prays to Gauchito Gill, and uh, his kid gets better and is healed. And then he goes and spreads that, uh, you know, that message throughout the, the surrounding area that his miracle was granted. But in that, in that situation, you know, here's a person who... Uh, killed somebody else and the person that they killed is now granting their their child life you know so this uh, really interesting you know kind of if you pray to me I will give you what you need you know from these folk saints is very common but what's not common is uh, just the level and broad spectrum of things that she covers you know yeah she seems to be like the I mean, I, I couldn't I couldn't think of an analogy. I'm of course using these like tech analogies. So I was like, you know, she's like the programming language. She's like the, uh, you know, English around the world. Or I guess you know, there's also Chinese and Spanish. But she's like a standard operating language that just does what you say. It's like a switch uh, Swiss Army knife. Because even from the research I was doing last night, the thing that caught my attention, or one of the things that caught my attention was how everyone who was being interviewed about Santa Muerte who uh, considered themselves a devotee and interestingly enough some of them retained some of their Catholicism as well but those who uh, swore by it swear by her as a miracle worker as one who gets things done and they were all giving testimony to how this happened that happened one woman uh, said she was pulled back from almost getting stabbed in the stomach. Another uh, guy I heard said that his son was shot in the head with a 9 millimeter and then was drinking with them three days later, that she, uh, death, that death actually grants favor that has results. Um, and, you know, um, in my own kind of case, I don't know how I can treat this, but what I can say, um, coming at it as a novice, is that my metaphor would be is like, well, it's a very effective uh, metaphor system. It's very powerful, very potent, because it's part of a process that a conscious entity goes through. Is eventually they die. We fear death, so you bring in this loving death thing, uh, which is friendly and inevitable. But that you can use that as a structure for focused intent and to have kind of results, and then. The, Another interpretation is going to be like, well, no, it's an actual entity that grants favors. Fine, granted. Okay, I just wanted to draw that delineation right there, just because, just to let people know that there's, there's another way to interpret it. Not that I necessarily do that way, but just from my background, as people know, in uh, the Campbell field and the My Big Toe field and whatnot, is that we're talking about, you know, a reality as being a simulation that is subject to one's intent and that one uses symbolic metaphoric vehicles for intent etc 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 I don't want to go deep into that tear but I just wanted to mention that so well that that in a way actually it's interesting because if you look at the uh, the books that are the the devotional material you know like the printed material um, almost every single one that I can think of starts out with uh, by your faith, you will be given what you deserve. By your faith, mm. so essentially saying exactly what you're saying, um, and then that's bolstered by the fact that you have someone like Dona Keita essentially saying, "No, this is death. Like you know, <laughs> uh, we're we're not talking about a goddess. This is death. 
and then when you consider what that is, you know, she's there. The a lot of the dev devotees are very insistent on the fact that this is not a being or an entity um, that they're talking about. They're literally talking about death. You know, and and that, you know, a, a, another way that she's kind of she opens up these philosophical questions because then you've got to ask yourself, well, what what are they dealing with? You know, and then you look at the the. Um, the iconography in that, and again, it's what does iconography mean? Because here's this iconography of uh, you know female, so gender specific, uh, reaper, you know, not a different type of skeleton, very much a grim reaper, um, very specific iconography, yet dealing with something that the devotees say is not an entity or being necessarily. It literally is death. You know, yet at the same time, this non-entity, non-being has efficacy as an agent in their lives up to the point of them seeing apparitions. And I had mentioned a boot scuff that I saw, but, you know, other people talking about apparitions literally see a, a physical Grim Reaper figure, you know, come out. Whether or not they're just hallucinating or whatever that question is, you know, that's beside the point here it's just it's simply that here you have people that on one end of the scale will admit that they're talking about death itself and yet on the other are literally having these experiences with what you know would probably be considered some sort of entity and treating it like an entity or a being or a person in some way yet you know just really focusing on the fact that it's still death it's not really an, an entity or being you know so going on what of that idea like there let's let me ask you what do you think of this idea because i've i've noticed that the the technology being suggested is that it's a very kind of standard folk technology where you give something and you get something right so um what do you think like of this idea of giving a devotion to one's death and then how that would end up kind of reprogramming you as an individual, in other words, like you get, you give yourself a, uh, or you give a devotion to an inevitability, one's terminus, one's end, one's medical death, and then from that, there's uh, also this intent vector, your wish, and that comes back to you and goes out into the world. So it's you balancing your existence in a way with this inevitability, and then going into like, well, what do I want? What do I want to? What do I want to do? What do I want to be? And that kind of thing, and 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 building your kind of uh, you know, consciousness platform from those two points in in history, if you will. Yeah, I did. I've never thought of it about it like that. That's a that's really an interesting. Yeah, seeing it temporarily like that. The way I mean, the way I would. I don't know. That's an interesting. That's an interesting. Perspective on the the relationship there. Um, you know, the way I was kind of looking at it was through. Uh, you know, if you look at every major tradition, they always have a momentum mori element to it, and she's kind of just uh, the ultimate memento mori, where you're you're only dealing with that. Yeah. You know? um, there's nothing else but that, and so uh, you know, in terms of of her granting it, that's yeah, it's interesting. I I sometimes get caught up in the fact that I'm looking at it from you know a background in like. The studying contemplative traditions, so I tend to think of it that way. And you know, I personally am not very practically oriented uh, in terms of the traditions and stuff. So, it um, I'm just thinking through what you were saying. I mean, that that's a really interesting way of of dealing with it like that. You know, even looking at the parapsychology stuff and that, I, ra I rarely think I'm practical. You know. It's, uh, more of just experiential or, or that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's it's interesting to think about the petition and what exactly that means in terms of the relationship with the with the iconography. Yeah, I mean, in some ways you can look at it like you know you've got the the Chode tradition in uh, Bon and Tibetan Buddhism, uh, where you have the idea of you know kind of sacrificing yourself to the uh, the hungry ghosts and the demons, you know, that, that devour you, you know, and then looking at that, that kind of concept through, uh, 
you know, sacrifices and religious ritual and that and propitiating gods and that kind of thing and paying, kind of paying off the, the inevitable end, you know. But she's, she's interesting in the fact that it seems that the petitions and that, they, they do have, you know, I mean, there's specific liquor types, uh, you know, tobacco, uh, smoking weed, stuff like that, like that all is associated with the, with the things that she's given. Um, so she does have kind of a personality through those, through the gifts that are given her, you know. Right, and she's even called, uh, what is it, Le Cabron? Uh, yeah, Le Cabron, uh, the, the she-goat or the bitch is what, you know. That's but, that. Yeah, that's that. That's that amazing personal level that it comes to. I mean, with, like with with the cigarette offerings and the the marijuana offerings, um, it's you don't just like leave it to her. You know, it's expected that you're smoking a cigarette as well with her. You know, I mean, it's like hanging out with your godmother, smoking a cigarette and talking about whatever you need. Yeah. You know, this amazingly personal relationship with this, despite, you know, some of the stories that come out about, you know, being afraid and, and being very respectful in that, there's also this level, I mean, the, the bitch stuff, the, the Cabrona thing, that comes out of an interview where a lady on the street, a devotee, was being interviewed and she was like, she's a bitch like us. You know, that's why we like her. So, you know, there's this incredible just acceptance and, and very, you know, very homey, you know, just very domestic feeling with it that you wouldn't expect with uh, a Grim Reaper figure, you know, or really any kind of devotion. It's, it's an amazing devotional tradition in that it is so real. It's so just, you know, daily life, everyday stuff. You know, and some of the, I, I, here's, I kind of, I'm going to track back to the confusion over the, uh, the offerings. Stuff. Sure. One of, the, one of the things that the people in the U.S. have a hard time recognizing, um, mainstream U.S. in that, uh, is that in anything like hoodoo, um, santeria, uh, voodoo traditions, any of that, when, when there's a, a ritual, the, any of the, the Afro-Latin traditions, when there's a ritual for either money or prosperity or um, health or anything like that, in terms of the African traditions that these things come out of, uh, the African influences in them, those states of being are considered an illness. So poverty is considered a spiritual illness. So you go to a spiritual worker who is going to cure you of that spiritual illness. You know, so it's not like the way we think of it, you know, in terms of capitalism and I have money because I worked hard or whatever. Um, the way it is in these systems, at least the, where the, you know, where these ideas come out of, is that that's literally a spiritual illness. When you're, when you're, you know, feeling depressed and that leads to poverty or whatever, you know, I mean, they they track it back to a kind of psychological, spiritual level. So, um, you know, propitiating something like Santa Muerte for money or health or freedom or any of that does at the base where this, you know, these ideas kind of come out of and, and come from, uh, have to do with the spiritual illness. You know, so we think of practical magic in terms of, you mentioned it earlier, mind science or something like that, where, uh, you know, it's, you, um, you know, very self-oriented and what do you want and, and that kind of thing. Well, in these traditions, it's not really like that, you know, at, at its best. I mean, obviously there's a spectrum and people do one thing or feel it's something else but at the very you know core of where that stuff comes from it does come from a, a spiritual idea of you know poverty and uh, that kind of stuff you know let me see right here um, uh, I think we should take five take five and come back excellent cool all right
that's my best uh, Art Bell impression right there, ladies and gentlemen. All right. I can't do anything else. You did a good Alex Jones earlier. <laughs> so that was pretty dead on. Oh, well, I've been doing him for years. Globalists. Like, he's, yeah. a, <laughs> he's a favorite. Well, we're back. We're back. We're back. And we just uh, took a step outside, and it's a beautiful fall day. And, uh, you know, the leave, the corpses of leaves are everywhere, and it's just <laughs> gorgeous. I mean, what can you say? It's, uh, that's uh, where I wanted to open up next, which is talking about how th the immediate aversion and how in the West we have this kind of totally different take on death than what's going on, you know, south of the border and, you know, to a degree now in the U.S. and Canada, but how we have a totally different view of this thing. It's horrifying. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to think about it. And yet, you know, our Spanish brothers and sisters are realizing that it's a source of real power and not only just of power, but this is obvious in the spread, the commercial spread, which we could talk about a little bit later. I'd love to talk about that, how... It, as a commercial force, Santa Muerte is just huge. So yeah. let's begin there with, because uh, that was what drew me to it, really, was the release of tension that I experienced after thinking about this um, this uh, figure. Yeah, it's a very different uh, way of thinking about death, a much more, you know, like you said earlier, you know, death is present in every moment. and really focusing on that, you know, and I think one of the interesting things, too, is that, you know, before the break, I'd mentioned um, African spirituality and the idea of, you know, uh, poverty being a spiritual sickness and that kind of thing, and that may seem weird in the context of Mexico, um, but if you look at the history of Latin America, um, we think of the U.S. as a melting pot, but as soon as World War I happened, um, one of the things that happened in the United States to actually make it what we know today as the United States was they realized that all these different ethnic groups weren't going to band together to fight a uh, foreign war. So you had this massive movement that, you know, you think of the Library of Congress's folk music collection and all that stuff. Well, a lot of that was based on building the mythology of the United States as a centralized, uh, you know, unit, a, a nation. Um, and trying to get all these different ethnic groups to uh, feel that they were part of that. Well, in Latin America, no less diverse in the, you know, the different, uh, you know, whether it was people from Spain, Portugal, Britain, Africa, uh, India even, you know, in the Caribbean and that, uh, from the, the British trade and, and that kind of thing. Uh, equally, an equal melting pot that really never had the nationalist pushes in the same kind of way that the United States had, which was very coordinated uh, effort to bring all these people groups together. In Latin America, uh, you know, whether it's Mexico, Central America, South America, um, you know, into the Caribbean and Cuba, it's much more diverse and that diversity has stayed potent, you know, and so all traditional societies have a very close relationship with death. You know, people used to bury uh, in their own yards, you know, and so your ancestors and the idea, is, the idea of family members who passed on was a much more prevalent thing in people's lives. And in Mexico, you know, through like Dia de los Muertos and stuff like that, um, these, these ideas are still alive. This idea of, you know, ancestry and, you know, familial ties that don't break once somebody dies. Um, you know, and our culture doesn't have any of that. You know, I mean, our, we've got a funeral industry. You know, I mean, everything's commercialized. And uh, even death. So we have a very displaced view of that kind of thing, you know, which uh, the, the death culture, you know, in Mexico and, and South America and the Caribbean and that is, is much different. And with the, you know, increased globalization and the internet and all that stuff, um, these ideas are starting to, to spread, you know, into the United States again um, and kind of wake people up to just how distant we are from this just inevitable fact of life. You know, I mean, you look at something like the, uh, the transhumanist movement, um, you know, or the, even an immortality movement and that kind of thing. 
uh, Ray Kurzweil consults with the government and the Department of Defense, and yet he is afraid of death and wants to be immortal in a machine. You know, and so this this really intense death anxiety um, is incredibly pre prevalent in uh, you know the United States at a very basic level. Yeah. And, and when you know, and when we talk about death, uh, this is something I've said for a couple of years now. Is that when we talk about death, dying, died, dead, is that we always really have to throw it up in quotation marks because we don't really know what we're talking about when we talk about this experience. The other thing that comes to mind um, is an article I read a couple of years ago, and I think it may have been in Brazil, but it was in South America, and it was about uh, an indigenous tribe who threatened mass suicide uh, when deforestation was coming in. And the reason why they um, threatened mass suicide is because that they were going to bulldoze over um, their uh, ancestors' graves and that they said that they would rather die, they would rather commit mass suicide right here and right there than uh, allow for that to happen. And it made me think of, you know, almost like a, and this may be perverse in a way, but a kind of almost, you know, Wi-Fi element to it, that where your ancestors are, at least for this culture, is where they had a lot of potent spiritual output. Right. Well, I mean, it's so it's so closely tied to the everyday existence that to lose that connection would literally to be to lose the health of your society. You know, because the um, in societies and, and cultures that have that concept of ancestor, uh, you know, ancestry and the presence of ancestors um, and the presence of the dead, to lose that connection with death is and then those who have passed on you know into whatever other state or whatever it is to to lose that connection literally is to lose the thing that allows you to live you know it would be um, I don't it'd be as if your your electricity was cut off you know I mean the, because they see the dead as so active in life and so prevalent in life and in every aspect of life you know that um, if that's taken away you literally cut off the basis of everyday life you know and that again comes with the the idea of practical magic um, or you know and or petitionary prayer even um, that a lot of what's going on in those situations is relationships with ancestral spirits so you know the prosperity of the family the food that the family eats which is shared a lot of times with the dead or with spirits and that um, to take that away, you know, you you basically just torn the heart out of the culture, you know. And you can't help but think about where, you know, our digi modern state is, where we're almost totally outside of genetic history and thrust into the information age, soon to be the virtual age, and how that has uh, a quality to divorce one from just the history of bone and blood. Right. Well, yeah, and it, it's interesting too because, you know, we are. The illusion is that we're outside of that, right. you know, um, and I'm not even talking about the dead, you know, having any kind of necessarily like material effect in the world, but um, just the the concepts and the way that that helps culture grow and and exist. You know, we're we're told that we are, and we're kind of pacified with a bunch of objects and media and drugs and stimulation in that which you know can distract us from that but when you look at the actual health of the culture itself I mean the US scores highest in all sorts of horrible indicators that our society is completely corrupt and broken you know so on a very deep emotive uh, you know psycho-spiritual level our society is collapsing you know and um, the things that have moved in to replace these intimate relationships with nature and with you know our ancestral past and with uh, you know, animal life and all that stuff, uh, the things that have moved in to replace that have not been adequate. Repl you can't replace those things, you know, and so until we are downloaded into a computer, um, it's, this is not really a tent, like, uh, a workable solution for, you know, human existence. 
So, you know, we, again, we can be pacified to kind of believe that we don't need those things, that we move beyond them. But when you look at the levels of, you know, mental illness, suicide, uh, rape, I mean, all sorts of indicators that show, like, you know, we're not doing good. Depression, alcoholism. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, addiction and the, the, the whole, you know, nine yards. That's another interesting thing, uh, addiction, actually, in terms of Santa Muerte and the drug culture. Um, one of the things that she's known for, so there, here's this narco saint, right, and according to the U.S. media and uh, mainstream media in Mexico, here's a narco saint who, uh, you know, is the, the goddess of, uh, you know, drug dealers and all that stuff. Um, one of the things, one of the miracles that she's best known for is getting people out of addiction um, and curing them of alcoholism or heroin addiction or, you know, whatever, crack, whatever you want. So... Um, you know, that it's really interesting uh, to see how that, you know, again, these kind of contradictions that play out, but also the fact that this figure of death in the, you know, in that cultural milieu that's more comfortable with death, even if they're not comfortable with Santa Muerte, becomes a healing figure, becomes a figure of health and, uh, you know, helping people's, you know, mental state and emotional state in curing them of addictions. Let's talk about the spread of Santa Muerte paraphernalia because it is, I mean, it's, it's as ubiquitous as death itself and just growing and growing and growing and growing. Your colleague mentioned that in his hometown of Richmond, Virginia, where it has only a 6% Latino population, that he found votive candles there to Santa Muerte and that they sold very, very well. Yeah, it's... It was interesting, uh, once you start to look for it and you kind of go out, um, you start to notice that it is more prevalent than you'd think. I know down here in Georgia, my niece found uh, Santa Muerte candles at a Kroger, which is basically the de facto uh, grocery store. Um, you know, and they had, where whatever neighborhood it was in, I think it was um, Stockbridge, uh, which is you know, sub-metro Atlanta. Um, they had Santa Muerte candles. And um, I know, you know, I know of a Botanica near where I'm at. I'm about 40 minutes outside of Atlanta. Um, there's a, like a half hour drive. I can go to a, a Botanica um, that carries, ex you know, extensively carries Santa Muerte stuff, books, uh, statues, uh, some of the more interesting devotional items like the, there's, hands that have the offerings already um, kind of sealed in them with the figure of Santa Muerte in the hand, you know, um, and, you know, stuff like that. And they sell that at this Botanica, um, which is quite close by me. Um, and then in that same neighborhood, there's a, a Mexican grocery that has can Santa Muerte candles. Um, I don't know, you know, if you, the farther out you go, obviously, uh, into more rural areas, I don't know if you'd be able to find it unless there was a heavy, uh, you know, Latino population. But it is in pretty much every state. You know, up in Chicago, um, the my friend was talking about how to learn Spanish. You would have to be immersed uh, and have to go down for an immersion in Mexico. And I'd just been to a store right by his uh, house, which was a botanica that dealt with Santa Muerte and Santeria, and that was it. You know, so I was kind of laughing at him because I was like, you know, immersion, just step outside of your door, you know. <laughs> so it's, it, um, yeah, it's, it's very prevalent and it's spreading. And with the Botanicas that do sell its goods, um, a lot of them are saying that, you know, well, the, the Botanica that I went to in Villa Park, um, the proprietor was, you know, she practiced Santeria and she said she really didn't have any belief in Santa Marta or even know really what it was or really care about it at all. But a lot of people were coming in and asking for it. And so, uh, you know, a good portion of her store's goods, despite the fact that she really had nothing to do with the tradition, was Santa Muerte based because of requests for it, you know. Um, so it's, you know, it's definitely, if you live near a major city, you will be able to find Santa Muerte fairly easily, you know. There was uh, uh, an article you did recently on, um, of course, you've been covering the whole Catholic controversy 
um, especially interesting because they they say that you can't sanctify death just as much as you can't sanctify um, obedience. Right. You know, uh, that was that was kind of interesting to me, of course, to bring that up because they're not flesh and blood. But one, uh, but there is an interesting theology developing within Santa Muerte, where death is totally um, a legitimate and petitionable force. And, and one of the gentlemen who I think you uh, translated an article about um, is a card reader, I think. I had his name up on here, but I don't have it anymore. Should I pull it up? Yeah, Hippolito Garza um, was, he's a, uh, there was this great blog post. Um, I, I don't remember the name of the blog, um, but great blog post, this woman had gone to uh, the public market in Juarez and met a, uh, a spiritual worker there who does tarot card reading, you know, spiritual cleansings, exorcisms, uh, you know, general spiritual worker work, um, but who was also a Santa Muerte devotee. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the he, he specifically spoke about how he was, you know, he had stepped away from the Catholic Church. He didn't feel that um, the Catholic path of faith, which involves, um, you know, baptism, uh, communion, uh, confirmation, you know, the different sacraments. He didn't think that the path of sacraments was really effective um, for him. That was, you know, he kept saying, this is my personal belief, but I don't think it is. And he said that, you know, he was one of the folks who said that, you know, they petitioned the Virgin of Guadalupe, it didn't work, petitioned St. Jude, um, and I'm assuming that was within, like, his spiritual worker work, because um, he said that he was born into a family that had taught him that tradition. So, um, you know, and that, that they weren't effective, and that when he went to Santa Muerte, that she was, you know, very effective, that she was she answered the, the things and, you know, he was, he highlighted the neutrality of it, you know, and said basically, like, if you're going to do bad, that's not on Santa Muerte, uh, that's the individual, you know, and that as the, as the Catholic Church has gotten more official in their condemnation, um, I think we're probably going to start to see more of that, that kind of thing where people, you know, but he's still, you know, again, he still recommended uh, praying to God before petitioning her, and then saying, uh, you know, the Our Fathers afterwards. So, the, the, so yeah, I'm sorry? Those, those were two things that caught my attention. There's a trailer to a documentary that I saw, uh, which I cannot find online. It looks like I'm going to have to order the DVD, which I haven't done in I don't know how long. But the beginning of the trailer starts with this mass group of people, and the first thing they do is, is ask God's permission to speak with death and that was one of the things that started welling the emotion up in me because I was just like oh my gosh that is so heavy right uh, the the other thing uh, that I wanted to mention right here was um, he was talking about his theological argument which was that from where he was coming from uh, Christ had to be touched by death and right. that Right. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, he I, he had said, it, and it's interesting too because it comes into uh, not the personhood, but uh, the fact that Christ defeated death in the Passion, um, which is why the Catholic Church feels that Santa Muerte is uh, incompatible with the faith. Um, he took that same story, and in his interpretation, um, because Christ died in the Passion, uh, that he had to go through death. And therefore, death was the the one that God trusted enough to handle His Son's transition into the resurrection. So, mm. for, for this guy, uh, yeah, and for a lot of devotees, that's not that's not him alone. That's a that's something I've heard in other places too. Um, the very uh, you know the passion itself, which the Catholic Church interprets as saying you know Christ defeated death. Death was the last enemy. And that kind of thing. Uh, the Santa Muerta devotees feel that, well, since Christ passed through death to get to, you know, the state of Godhead, then uh, obviously death has a part in that and is the, you know, again, the second only to God in power, you know. And he went into, he went into other things. I mean, he went into details about it of, you know, if Christ gave up 
uh, all these worldly powers, then why why was death still necessary? Christ had already given up. He'd already not you know Satan had already tempted him. He didn't have to anything like that. Then why why at the end of all that did uh, does death come into it, you know? And so he said, well, in this, you know, in, in Garza's opinion, well, death came into it because she's that powerful, you know? Now, going on that idea um, of how even the figure of Christ had to be touched uh, by Santa Muerte, right? Or the Holy Death. Um, you mentioned also something about the Vedas. Um, uh, or maybe it was maybe it was your colleague where they said the Vedas that the prince goes to uh, deaths. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a yeah, there's a, a story about uh, the uh, the uh, a king makes a bet that uh, his best. He makes a, basically a king makes a bet for his best possession. So if uh, and he loses the bet, so uh, the best possession turns out to be his son. And his son uh, agrees that, you know, he'll be taken to, uh, you know, basically essentially sacrificed, you know. And so the father is like, no, I don't want, you know, I can't, I can't do that with my son. I thought they were going to take horses. You know, I thought they were going to take some money or something. I didn't think they were going to take my son. So the son's like, no, it's dishonorable if I don't do this. So, you know, I'll go and I'll accept the sacrifice. So he gets killed and he goes down to death's palace and he knocks on the door and nobody answers. So uh, he knocks on the door again, nobody answers. So he doesn't quite know what to do at this point because he's been sacrificed in this bet. He's got to die. Death's not there to take him. So he waits it out and death shows up and goes, oh, uh oh, you know, I've uh, made a mistake. <laughs> Sorry, you know, I wasn't home and uh, you're here and I should have been here. That was really rude of me. <laughs> So uh, what do you want? I'm not going to take you, uh, but I'll give you, I'll give you what you want. And so uh, the prince asks for the secret of death. And death goes, oh, even the gods don't have that. I take the gods. You know, like you can't, you can't have that. And he goes, well, you, you weren't here when I came here. That was pretty rude. And death goes, yeah, you're right. I owe you something. And I didn't, you could have whatever you wanted. So here's the secret, the secret of death. And he gives him uh, something which I'm probably... Uh, not the best way of putting it, but it's it's not, it's like a fire ceremony um, that he's given. So uh, you know, a meditation on fire. So um, it's interesting to see the parallels there with, um, and I think that that piece I I had written. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it in the context of Santa Muerte. I know I'd mentioned it in the context of the Negrito in Alchemy. Oh well, maybe we can just go right into that because if we're going to talk about death and the mythology of death. Uh, we might as well jump right into Negredo, Negredo right here because you were also the person who introduced me to alchemy. And at first I was like, eh, whatever. And then I, <laughs> and then just like with the Santa Muerte stuff, like months later it comes around to me and I'm like, damn. So we might as well go like right into Negredo, blackness, the fire, and so on. Yeah, and, and that that was you know that in that context, uh, Christ's death. Um, it's not in the Bible, it's not a biblical narrative, but within the kind of mythology of Christ's death, there's the idea of the harrowing of hell, where Christ has to go down to hell and uh, save the people who had died in sin because he had yet to be born. So, um, the, you know, and in that he passes through hell, and then you have the resurrection on the third day. Well, before so, we go into more, I guess we should say real quick, what is alchemy? Ah, uh, <laughs> in what in what sense? Well, I guess I guess if I had to summarize it, I would say that it's a it's a it's a it's a set of spiritual metaphors or spiritual technology that has to do with turning a you know quote unquote lead soul into a gold soul or the philosopher's stone or or a vessel that's worthy of life. And you see that in Egypt too with the iconography of the scarab, the dung beetle, and so on. Well, and there's also the, it, there's you can never forget the practical end of it. Right. Um, the, and the fact that, you know, at, at points in time it was very much uh, a specifically practical art. The, the word, a lot of the early alchemical manuscripts in that are on dyeing and on um, basically electroplating gold. Wow. You know, and creating gold substitutes and that kind of thing. 
So there, there's definitely a material element to it, um, which again, I think that it, it's another one of those things that in our contemporary society, we have a really hard time grasping the level at which the material and the spiritual in a tradition like alchemy coming out of the influences that it comes out of um, is working with. And that it's, you know, one of the, the key points in alchemy is that, uh, you know, the as above, so below kind of concept where uh, the material and the spiritual are all a part of the work. You can never separate those two things. Now, when you mean practical, you're talking about not just sitting around thinking about lighting the fire of your soul, but actually doing sort of just this uh, chemistry work, really. Yeah, and you know, the, you mentioned fire, um, lighting a fire. <laughs> you know, like right. actually, actually going out and working with fire, and right. going and working with water, and going out and working with air, because. Uh, if you psychol if you if you take psychology and, and you intellectualize these ideas, mm -hmm. um, you're not actually dealing with fire. <laughs> <laughs> like you got actually you can't like you can't just think fire. You got to actually go deal with fire and then see what lessons you can learn from that and what does that mean to the work. Fascinating. And so you know people want to jump right into lab work or even uh, you know the herbal alchemy stuff, but there's some basic things that as a contemporary person we you know a lot of people don't deal with anymore like lighting a fire keeping a fire tending a fire and then when you start to get into the practical work of actually working with the materials there's specific temperatures that you've got to get stuff to and if you're working fully traditional um, you're not working with uh, you know exact measurements and so it's it's very much that you know that's why it's an art because it requires um, a kind of patience and that working with the material um, you know and you can I don't kind of a weekend a, a weekend example you know would be um, you know doing like a like a mandala or something like that you right. know drawing a mandala where you're meditating you're drawing you're working at or even sculpting or any kind of art you know where you're you're meditating on a concept and then it's going through your body and then it comes out in a material form and if you're really fully working with that there's a there's a give and take with the material that happens that you can you can get to deeper levels with that and so you know when we only talk about spiritual alchemy and we only talk about say you know how alchemy is a type of psychology or you know or if we only focus on the material stuff and we say no it's early protochemistry or whatever all those things miss the integral nature of the art itself and uh, it's you know what it's full functionality and it's full expression you know and and kind of vitality so so before we close on alchemy the goal is of course as I mentioned this kind of idea of a of a soul that that becomes worthy of a life the great work right yeah it, it's it, refining the bringing the material up to the spiritual and the spiritual down to the material one last thing is for those of you who uh, uh, like some good old pulp fiction, there's a short story in the book Haunted by Chuck Palahniuk, the, one of the last ones called Obsolete, where he describes a mass suicide taking place on Earth because they realize heaven is on Venus and that you get reincarnated and that the Earth is a rock polisher and it polishes you through friction and heavy experiences and things like this. It's very similar to the ideas of like karma and the wheel and always turning, but the joke in the Palahniuk a uh, short story is that um, everyone starts committing mass suicide and clogging the spiritual recycling system because they're tired of living on Earth. They just want to go to <laughs> Venus on Heaven. So, sort of a similar idea there, folks. But so that's alchemy. Let's rewind back to what you were talking about, Nigredo and uh, this uh, Christ parable that's not in the Bible. Yeah, the the harrowing of hell um, is a. Uh, I don't know exactly when it came about. Uh, but it's, you know, definitely was apparent in the Middle Ages. You have a lot of picture, you know, like uh, paintings and that of the Christ going through the harrowing of hell. And it's the period between um, his death on the cross and then his, uh, you know, walking, moving the stone and walking out of the cave. Um, and the story was that he was down in hell, you know, basically defeating hell and bringing out the, the souls who had died, who were, their only sin had been to die before he was uh, resurrected. 
So um, with that, you have this narrative that then when you think about the, in terms of the, the prince going down to death and, you know, or any of the Orpheus, you know, going into the underworld, you got there's a ton of stories like that, um, which then become focused through this concept of harrowing of hell as well. By um, Hercules, which, even. Yeah, Hercules, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you've got, it's just innumerable, innumerable. It's the hero's journey, you right. know, I mean, you've got, Joseph Campbell, uh, all the things that he talked about, that kind of stuff. So, um, but it's you know it's extra biblical. That's not in the Bible. There's no description of what Christ did, you know, in that that interim of the three days. So, um, but I think the fact that it is extra biblical and that it comes up as such a potent aspect of you know kind of the folk faith um, shows that. Uh, whatever those stories relate to about the hero or Christ or um, the prince or whatever going down to death and having that experience, you know, when um, you mentioned Egypt earlier, you know, the books of the dead, which were also for the living, it was an initiatory kind of mystery. Um, that concept of going to death to gain the greatest uh, secret of life itself, um, like Gilgamesh, right? Like that's the... Mm -hmm. the story so um, whatever that whatever those stories are kind of clustering around that concept um, is very much prevalent I think in what we're seeing with Santa Muerte the same kind of question you know the same mystery there, there, you know, there. except for like we like you mentioned earlier uh, with the fact that Santa Muerte is so prevalent in uh, you know folk culture street culture mm -hmm. um, that here you've got a tradition that death is right there. You know, it's a grim reaper standing right in front of you. And that's that moment of the prince meeting death, you know, because you're not dead yet and there's death. So what's happening? And that gives that access, you know, potentially for the person to have that experience where they're given that secret, you know, depending on their relationship with that and their, uh, their ability or, you know, whatever, their humility. Um, if they're worthy of it, they're given that confrontation simply by the devotion. You know, so it's it's incredibly egalitarian that you have a story, you know, an ancient story from the Vedas that discusses a prince being given it, you know, and whether or not we want to think of that as a uh, prince in terms of, um, you know, actual royalty or something or a spiritual you know, sort of, or aristocracy or something. Here you've got a tradition that's available to taxi drivers or whoever, hmm. you know, similar to alchemy, um, available to everyone, open, if they, can, if they can access it, that promises, in a certain sense, in the potential of the symbolism and the iconography that's being worked, um, to have access to that, the greatest secret of life, you know. Now, the other thing it brings to mind is, uh, I was, uh, it was, I was made aware of this theme of the presence of death in um, initiatory uh, sects and societies, mystery schools and philosophical schools throughout the Mediterranean, um, where, um, I mean, you see it also in Freemasonry and other groups where the first initiation is a, a mock death or a mock funeral, which may or may not include, um, you know, certain... Uh, hallucinogens or dissociatives that they as well as you know ceremony and sort of things like that and I think this was even in Pythagoras's school where the the whole thing is about you have this this introduction to death for the initiate the possibility the potentiality the reality of it and then if we take that all the way back to this one we're talking about right here alchemy the first phase is the death phase, the nigrado phase, and I can't help but think about my upbringing, which was more uh, Zen-centric. And when you look at kind of the Zen mind, uh, Zen mind is about sort of nakedness, and it makes sense to me that a Western mystical philosophical tradition would begin with uh, uh, a negative. Not, yeah, you know, uh, that's... With her being second only to God, I think that um, you, you mentioned Zen, you know, and obviously in Zen Buddhism, it's one of the Buddhist traditions that's farthest away from um, any kind of uh, deification of uh, the Buddha, you know. Um, with, with that 
kind of tradition, Santa Muerte, as being second only to God, and thus the thing that kills all the other gods, um, kind of provides access to that sense. You know, at least there's a potential for it, too, which is, I think, one of the things, uh, another sort of hazy aspect about Santa Muerte, she's very much, uh, very much activated by potentials. Um, we, we see, you know, this faith tradition kind of spring out of nowhere, even though it was, you know, uh, developing under the radar, um, suddenly gets a public face and then bam, you know, tons of books are published, shrines pop up everywhere, um, seemingly out of nowhere, but the potential was always there. And so, and when you start to look at her iconography and the symbols that are associated with her and what can be worked with that and what people, you know, devotees are already saying, um, it's amazing to see how those potentials become reality in uh, the lives of you know the people that work with her. The other thing about this image that struck me when I really gave it the attention it deserved is that I realized when it comes to anthropomorphic images, you know, some of the vogue, at least in the alternative spirituality community, some of the vogue um, goddesses or gods are rather complex. They have attributes. You have, you know, like uh, Babylon and Thelema, of course. You have Gaia and uh, other sort of more nebulous DIY style earth magic type things. Uh, and you have like these, these feminine goddess archetypes, uh, sacred prostitutes, etc. Um, but this, the, and you know, for example, like take a look at Babylon where you have a woman on a nine-headed dragon coming to town I think it's nine heads, maybe it's seven, I forgot. But just that image is sort of like not very easy to identify with, you know, regardless of whatever you want to say about it. It's just alien to experience. Um, now, other anthropomorphic mystical or magical images, like that of a child or that of copulation, right, you know, more easily identifiable to the average person and what they mean and things like that. But it was the this anthropomorphization of death and then recontextualizing her out of this, you know, which I want to go into after this is the, the previously sort of male Grim Reaper and what that one was like as opposed to Santa Muerte here. Um, that the death icon, a figure, symbol, meaning is hugely more visceral to immediate experience than a picture of a baby, you know, new life and so on or images of copulation, where you have union, yoga, religion, tantra, etc. But it's this, this death one on the far end, where it's like, whoa, that is where the real mystery is. Because the real mystery is death, which is sort of outside of living consciousness. Living consciousness can't really approach death, and yet it is present. Right, right, yeah, exactly, exactly. And if you think about it, too, the fascination and well the reason that we can read a symbol like a uh, you know like a baby or something like that you know like you think of like a cherub or the uh, the eternal child figures um, that show up in some of the alchemical manuscripts and that um, the reason that we can identify that is because the child represents the death of the baby which is then killed by the you know next step in, in getting older and we are no longer children and therefore there's a de the kind of death and separation there so we're always seeing things from these differences well what are those differences those differences are small deaths or, or little breaks between the whole and you know that kind of thing so what we're seeing it is the way that you know a, what a devotee of Santa Muerte might say is that what we're seeing literally is what Santa Muerte is showing us, you know, and so again, you have the, it just can always be reworked back to this, like you're pointing out, I mean, Santa Muerte becomes such a basic figure that all those other symbols get consumed by the potential that she has in her own iconography and symbolism. Exactly, and that's the thing that's really blowing my mind, is because I am not an icon guy, I am like, uh, you know, I find them fascinating. I've played with them. I've done visualization things. I've, I've like played with the available spiritual technology market. I was doing yoga when I was like a preteen and, you know, meditation at, at around the same time. And then even going into like techno aided ones like binaural beat technology. I have never had a reaction to an icon like the reaction 
I'm going through right now with Santa Muerte. Yeah, it's po- I mean it's potent. It um the, it didn't hit me. I kind of yeah, I kind of had that as, yeah, kind of had that as well. The initial research, I was kind of blown away by uh what it was and was was excited by that, but I, the the personal right. aspects hadn't really kicked in. Right. Um you know, and then I was I was really trying to get into it because I'm not Catholic. Um, I've never been to Mexico. <laughs> you know, um, I've had high school Spanish. You know, so, <laughs> yeah, uh, right. Yeah, right. Trying to get into the trying to get into studying it. Um, how do how does one do that? You know, and so I started really paying attention to the iconography and really thinking through what the devotees were saying, and in that process you know, kind of had a similar experience to yours where um, suddenly you're facing this, you know, symbol complex or whatever that becomes something more and has this whole thing and starts to change the way that you look at stuff, you know. And so it's, it's and even dealing with the, the condemnations from the Catholic Church or, you know, statements from the U.S. Marshal, um, other academic uh, kind of uh, surveys of the tradition, you know, where they're coming from and stuff like that, uh, that stuff starts to get filtered through the lens of Santa Muerte too, you know, where because the icon's so potent and simple and just there and so directly related to something that's so integral to, you know, life, right? Um, you just start to kind of see it everywhere and it starts to start kind of, you know, be, you know, almost as if you're seeing like through the eyes of Santa Muerte. You know, and which that, I and I would assume that if someone's really really frightened by it and it takes on some kind of you know in their mind evil or you know satanic sense, I could see how somebody would be really freaked out by that. You know, by the fact that yeah, death is constantly like around you, and then you have this icon or figure which reminds you of that that you think satanic. Like I could see how that would really mess with somebody's head. Yeah, yeah, and that's 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 what I'm sensing right now is the threat because even I at first was averted, somewhat threatened by it, but then it opens this whole door where it asks you, "Why are you averted to this? Why do you feel threatened by it? Why do you?" And so then at the same time, considering all these like, you know, agencies and institutions and religions that are threatened by it makes one think about the maturity of the human beings who are taking it into their life, where it's like, no, we really have to have a dialogue with death. Like, you don't understand. Everything, right? right? right. Everything that you're talking about and whatnot leads to death. Everything that you're proposing leads to death eventually. So we actually have to have a dialogue with the phenomenon, the process, in some cases, the entity, etc. Yeah, exactly. And that's, I think that's where, you know, we were talking about the, the commercialization of it and that um, if you look at other aspects of death in contemporary culture in the United States um, and Europe and, you know, around the world because of the internet and global, the, uh, you know, the folks who do, well, I mean, I work, uh, you know, with uh, the observatory room up in Brooklyn to put on events and uh, Morbid Anatomy Library is a part of that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of a re, you know, look at death culture and what is, you know, what's our relationship with death, the medical humanities and that. And then there's the death salon, um, you know, which is directly dealing with scholars and, you know, artists and every, uh, you know, creatives and that coming together to discuss what is death, you know, in culture, like, because we're not looking at it, you know, our culture is not dealing with it, but like you said, we're moving down a path in a lot of different areas where we're causing extensive damage and, you know, essentially summoning death, you know, calling death into the world. So, um, yeah, I think that dialogues, it's completely necessary. And then we see this growth of Santa Muerte, which shows that obviously people are thinking about this. You know, obviously this is an issue, you know, and, and where does Santa Muerte come up from? It comes up from, you know, the barrios of Mexico, where you've got corrupt government officials, corrupt cops, you've got gangs, you've got, um, you know, every level of violence, like, across the board, and Santa Muerte appears. 
you know, so I don't think that, you know, I think our culture has a hard time dealing with symbols because they don't really know what to do with them. Sure. You know? like we either want to we either want to give it and say like, oh, this is a symbol of a god or a goddess or god or whatever. Right, like you show them the eye and the triangle and there's so many different reactions. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah, and put this like really heavy narrative weight on it, you know, or we want to completely dismiss it and say it doesn't mean anything, it's crap and it's just a veil for something else and these people are, you know, narcos or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, like the, what the symbol when it crops up with such prevalency is really saying is hey guys wake up like this you know this is common like you guys are <laughs> stewing in it and it's going to start appearing in your dreams in your uh the symbols that crop up in your life the symbols that you associate with and feel comfortable with um those are all signs that that thing is there and prevalent and coming you know it's kind of like uh you know like a skin rash shows you that you're having an allergic reaction you know when you start to see uh death cults pop up um you're living in a society where death is a huge uh, issue, you know? Yeah, and this, this brings me to something I wanted to talk about, which uh, was kind of unplanned and came to my mind a while ago before we got um, on here, because otherwise I would have sent you a message about it earlier so you had a chance to think about it. But it, but it is kind of a strange concept, um, and that is the threat of death that death isn't just threatening in the sense of like one day one will die but that forces agencies institutions regimes religions and just your neighbor you know if you're in the wrong neighborhood will threaten you with death so in other words death is a kind of punishment death is a threat it's a death threat so I mean, it's kind of strange, but when you think about it, what does one army do to another army? Well, we're going to threaten you with death. That's what we're going to do. Death and destruction. Right, right. Now, that to me is kind of interesting, how when it comes to the threats, that's the threat, is that we will kill you. Right, exactly. And that's, that's exactly why you have uh, contract killers and people like that who work with Santa Muerte not just to make their kills efficient or to not be caught by the cops, but to work through their feelings and fears of death because of the fact that they issue that threat of death and then also know that that could very easily come back on them. You know, and so how do they work through that fear? That was, that was an interesting thing when I started looking at Santa Muerte and looking at this tradition. Um, I, was, I was working at a music store right out of college and uh, the the uh, currency exchange next door got robbed and in the process um, you know since I was there and a, a friend of mine was at the store at the time since we were essentially witnesses to it uh, we got held at gunpoint and my friend's an idiot uh, <laughs> <laughs> this we, is sorry sorry was, the, this is why I wanted to bring David on everybody I wanted to bring him on because he's always got like something like this like I was held at gunpoint my friend was totally <laughs> dumb <laughs> Well, no, I mean, we were sitting outside, like, we're, we were sitting outside having a cigarette at this music store. I had, the, I had the phone sitting next to me, and the next thing I know is some guy's reaching for the phone. And people are rude, you know, like, I figured, like, oh, he needs to use the phone. So I look up, and I'm, you know, facing a 9 millimeter gun. And I was like, oh, no, like, this whole, <laughs> an average night at the music store, you know, in suburban Chicago, like, this is different. So I... Uh, you know, was <laughs> like, well, at this point, like, what do you do? Well, my friend's smoking the cigarette, and we go, you know, the guy's telling us to get back in the store, and my friend's like, he tells the guy who's holding the gun to us, he goes, oh, I've got a, I've got a cigarette, I can't, you know, I can't go in the store. And the guy looks at him like, are you insane? I'm holding a gun at you, like, you need to get in the store, you know? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. So <laughs> Like throws the cigarette, but I mean, this was this was at that point. I was sure that we were going to get shot. Then the guy tells me to face the wall. The way that the thing was positioned, I couldn't face the wall. So I'm facing this guy while he's like wandering around with this gun, and I look at him and I'm like, "Oh crap, the dude's on coke too." <laughs> so he's coked up. He's got this gun. He's sweating like crazy. He's nervous. His friend is robbing the currency exchange, and uh, he goes to steal CDs, and none of the CDs are in the case. So, like, as this is progressing, all I'm seeing is everything's going wrong in this situation. I'm going to have a bullet straight through my head in about a few seconds to a minute here. 
and it all turned out okay. There was no problem. Uh, I talked to the guy, like, was fine with it, like, came to a realization where I had no choice. There was nothing I could do. I was either going to die or not die, and it became really calm. And so um, afterwards I found out that the whole robbery was set up by a corrupt cop and uh, who had gotten people's personal information to blackmail the, uh, or not even blackmail, I guess extort the uh, currency exchange clerk. Um, and so when I started dealing with the Santa Muerte tradition and reading about it and thinking about what the symbol meant, I realized that in a way that moment where I had that gun on me was very similar to what people describe, you know, where Santa Muerte saves them. Right. And so I started thinking about that in terms of, I was in a moment where I was sure I was going to die and very well could have died. And the peace that that entailed and the release that that entailed. And what does that mean through this symbol set? So I had like a very, you know, and have a very visceral connection to that I can access that level of the tradition, you know, and think about it. So, um, you know, I just think it's a very powerful way to, in our contemporary, I mean, we've got drone pilots now that are, reading my mind. you know, I mean, drone pilots that are killing people in computer games, but they're really killing people. And, you know, death is becoming distant and strange, but still having these psychological effects. And so, you know, you have something like Santa Muerte, and it's a way to, like, I use the word conversation, you know, to have a conversation with this, uh, this thing that's so prevalent and yet so distant, you know, in our lives. And unless you've had, like, a direct, you know, experience with it, like, I've had car accidents and stuff like that where I've walked away from flipped over cars. So, again, thinking about that in terms of the symbol set and the ideas behind Santa Muerte has really given an interesting, you know, insights into the tradition. And at the same time, the tradition has given me insights into uh, my own experiences with that, you know. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up the drones because even in the United States, I mean, we've been talking about developing a, um, an oppressive death culture here for quite some time now. I mean, the rise in um, uh, uh, homicides uh, by, you know, people who are supposed to be protectors, police officers. I'm not trying to just uh, nag on police officers because I would never do that because I know many of them are, are very sincere about justice and law, which I'm very sincere about too. I don't really subscribe to an anarchic way of view. I think that you have law. If you don't have law, you don't really have anything, but it has to be like legitimate law. In other words, everyone has to follow it. But when you see in America with the rise of the drones, as you mentioned, as well as uh, the rise in um, uh, homicides by police officers. I mean, I just read on Facebook this week where uh, a kid was shot in a pickup truck because uh, someone wanted to prove a point or something like that, his grandfather or something. It's just utterly ridiculous. I mean, when you read about the level of, of, of homicides, they, they, it, they become ludicrous. They become absurd. And, it, and it's like, well, we have to have a conversation with our protectors. Um, but besides that, take in mind something like habeas corpus or the rise of, uh, you know, certain legislation in the United States where it's basically like, well, you know, you don't even have a trial. And in fact, we can sort of kill you if we want to. I mean, that's why Rand Paul and company had that uh, filibuster a few months ago wherein they were on the floor saying can the president legally murder a US citizen which which has already happened twice from what I understand at least with uh, uh, drones and I think one of them was a child so there is this you know uh, for a place that is trying to stand for justice uh, you have justice and law um, to see this kind of thing where death is sort of like, well, we'll actually deal death. Like, we'll straight deal death, and, uh, you know, why not? Now, again, that's not to put the whole onus on that institution, but to say that it is very real. It's a very real thing. Um, so to to see it spread to the United States in ways, I mean, I'm not really surprised. It's it's uh, the whole war situation. I mean, it's a, it's a country based on war in the military industrial complex, etc. It doesn't always have to be that way, but that's what it is right now. So the whole sort of reality is around this new 
legalization of death. And from that, I'm really not surprised that you have a figure like Santa Muerte showing up, who is, you know, death, but also a kind of, like, antidote to that crisis. Right. And also, I mean, the yeah, it, uh, definitely, uh, definitely an antidote to it. And uh, you know, uh, as you said before, not uh, not necessarily a negative figure. You know, a figure that's very uh, conducive to communication and that you know within the the iconography and her tradition. Um, and I, I think something that's interesting is I was as as you were talking about American death culture and you know uh, the military industrial complex and all that the one thing that a lot of people don't talk about anymore we talk about drones we talk about the um, you know the um, the surveillance state and all that kind of stuff right. is the fact that nuclear weapons exist right very powerful nuclear weapons right now are armed and waiting to be fired and we invented them here <laughs> it was a global, there was a whole global effort to invent them and they were tested in New Mexico and they were tested in Hawaii we dropped them on Japan they've been used we have more powerful ones now we've got Fukushima blasting radiation into who knows what right. all over and we've released the death genie out of the bottle. Mm -hmm. We're not just, you know, it's not just drones and the military and police and all that. Right. Literally right now dying, period. Right. We have released nuclear energy. It's, we don't have a culture that can handle it. We don't have responsible leadership that can handle it. And we live under constant threat of immediate annihilation. Right. And in that situation, you know, Burroughs wrote about this. Burroughs wrote about how America had, you know, had, I don't know if you can even really say America because Germany was going for the bomb too. I mean, everybody was going for the nuclear thing. Mm -hmm. So really a global effort. Um, but we've gone to death's door and there's no turning back. You know, I mean, there's either enlightenment or there's going to be some kind of catastrophe. It's not a point where we're, you know, maybe the king will die and we'll get a better regime. Yeah, in right. No replacement, no replacement for government or anything is going to solve the fact that we have unleashed radiation to levels that will eventually destroy us if we don't set it off faster. Yeah. There's no, there's no escaping the atom bomb. Right. And that question is something that we kind of dance. I mean, the Fukushima thing you know, like sort of awaken people to that, but the the issue of nuclear energy is vital to, you know, just realizing that we are not, we're not in control of things anymore. You know, there's, something's been released that can't be put away, you know, and that I, that's another reason that I think I'm kind of, uh, you know, if, if you can say subconscious or, you know, uh, symbolic level or whatever, I think that's another thing that's playing into the Santa Muerte stuff, you know, is that as a global culture, we're, we've already passed the tipping point, you know? Yeah, uh, the, the other thing that uh, it brought to mind, of course, is, you know, Oppenheimer, I am become death, the destroy of worlds. Right. I mean, that's, that was a real, that was a real moment. It's like, it's like humanity, at least from what we know, there are some researchers out there who say, like, I mean, even Oppenheimer himself said, we've done this before, you know, in a kind of ominous sort of way where he was implying that, that human civilizations have come and gone based on atomic power. Right. And whether or not that's true, the suggestion is certainly real today. Well, and going back to, going back to alchemy, too, uh, if you look at Falconelli, uh, one of the key elements of Falconelli's social commentary is uh, about nuclear energy and about the nuclear question. Really? Yeah. And that uh, it's a, you know, it, it, with Oppenheimer saying, you know, I've become death, destroyer of worlds, and you've got Jack Parson summoning, right. uh, you know, Babylon for the apocalypse. Um, and then going to work on the the you know Manhattan Project and that mm -hmm. uh, there's a big question there of what happened in that moment in history, 
and symbolically what does that mean and what does that mean for what we're doing right now and the fact that we have a major movement that's bringing you know a figure of death forward as a popular cult figure when the last time that that happened was uh, <laughs> on a small scale um, at the end of the century in France is a reaction to the French Revolution uh, other small scale was prior to Nazi Germany when you had a big upswing in decadent art and uh, other times have been the plague deaths and that so when you start to see these death symbols um, you know even if you look at the current scholarship on this stuff look at the times when those symbols became prevalent what was going on in society and then think about how prevalent it is now what we kind of ignore it at the same time and what does that mean for what's going on and you know what could be kind of coming down the line and not only that but you know you can't not neglect uh, Damien Hirst's for the love of God the stat the skull adorned with uh, right. Diamonds, yeah, right. right and then it making an appearance in uh, Jay-Z music video and then indeed um, the entire weird like and, and weird in a lame way I would like to mention there's there's a lot of people who harp on <laughs> like the the, uh, weird. the uh, yeah weird in a lame way where they like where people tend to harp on the um, the presence of you know occult and esoteric imagery in a, a popular Hip hop, pop music, pop R and B, and that kind of thing, and how it does have a kind of death centric, uh, you know, resurrection, exorcism type of thing, and and that's like that's more of a lame interpretation for me. It's like it it never really it actually I never thought the occult could suck until I really like watched <laughs> what the music industry could do with it post like say Led Zeppelin and the hair bands and all the like heavy metal stuff. One's kind of like hip pop you know it's like what i call it. it's hip pop it's not hip hop it's hip pop once that kind of like picked up on all these kind of like occultish themes i was ne i've never been more disappointed in a genre of music uh, you know i thought i was going to hate the 80s forever you know growing up i thought i was always going to be like oh, i just don't get with those synthesizers man it just sounds too robotic but seeing them and their performances and their over the top glitz and glam and type of thing it's like you know it it's so, it gives it, you know, if they're satanic, they give Satanism a bad name. <laughs> I kind of like that Jay-Z video. <laughs> <laughs> it's addictive. It really yeah, is. The chant, yeah. the chant, I, on to the next yeah, no, one. Exactly. I've got, I don't know, I've, uh, uh I like pop music. <laughs> You know, I'm I'm neutral to. Uh, it's a lesson that Santa Muerte has taught me: is to be neutral to uh, to pop music. Oh, I'm such a um. hater. <laughs> <laughs> That's that. You know that that song grew on me for its for the fact that you could pick it apart and have a lot of fun with it because it is this kind of you know bizarre hypnotic chant onto the next one with like these suggestions of mammon going on and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, so. and, and human sacrifice and stuff because all the people portrayed in it are dead. It was. I didn't even notice that. Is that right? Yeah, they were all dead. <laughs> on to the next one, man. On to the next one. Like, <laughs> like the the potential. See, that's what I think. The occult potential in that song, like a necromantic pot potential in that song, right. is uh, is pretty. Uh, it's pretty fun. <laughs> that's I mean, the conspiracy, like the conspiracy stuff, goes nuts over it. Sure. You know, it, like I think those. I think that may be one of the videos where, like, they actually pause it, like at a certain point where Satan's face appears in like a flame somewhere. You know, like off to the like left hand side or something. Yes. I mean, like that one. That one spurred deep analysis by the conspiracy, the conspiranoia crowd. So. Yeah, that's a that's a. They go through it almost shot by shot. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, in some ways, if you look at, like, if you look at very detailed but not very nuanced um, kind of history, um, where the person's gone to, like, a really, like, the scholar goes in and just, like, picks apart, like, you know, like, just almost down to, like, the, the skin flakes level of history, you know? But there's really no nuance to it, but it's really helpful when you're looking for those skin flake details. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I think kind of the paranoid conspiracy stuff is good for. <laughs> because they will go to like every aspect of it, and it may be a jumbled mess once it gets you know together into the picture that's presented. Right. But there's so many different details and facts there that you can kind of go in and you know 
very carefully like unpick the facts and kind of explore neat different little areas of history and you know social psychology that's great this is that's good for a break right there you want to take another five and then we'll like see if we do a little more yeah cool man all right see you Okay, we're back, and um, to close the segment, I have a couple more questions I wanted to ask you, um, and this is about, uh, well, there's two aspects to this part of the conversation, and that's kind of the rise of female-centric, you know, deities or forces or what have you, and I mentioned this earlier in something I wrote today where um, it seems that uh, the modern mo alter the modern alt spiritual mind is interested in, you know, Gaia, Kali, Babylon, um, Eris with the Discordians and these kinds of things. And now we have Santa Muerte showing up and just kind of thinking about that, how it's moving from the, you know, sort of masculine phallic interpretation of uh, sanctity and divinity and so on to this female-oriented one. I wondered if you had any... Uh, thoughts or ideas about that it, it's interesting with the um, the development of Santa Muerte because there's a couple different skeleton saints in Latin America there's uh, San La Muerte which is uh, a male figure there's uh, Ray Pascual who's another male skeleton figure um, and there's Senor La Muerte which is kind of similar and maybe tied into uh, San La Muerte, but um, those have actually, they have a developed cult persona where they're, in, they're tied to at least a mythical, if not a historical personage, so um, you would think that they would have an easier time developing into something as fully... Uh, you know, as full blown as what's going on with the Santa Muerte tradition, but they haven't, and they they've been around, you know, as open um, traditions longer. So, you know, for some reason, Santa Muerte took off where they did, you know, and and was able to, you know, grow in ways that they haven't been able to. And so that it, it is interesting that, you know, here you've got uh, a female representation of death that takes on qualities that death really has never taken on, you know, in U.S. culture. So despite that, there is these male interpretations of death down in the same area. They're not catching on as much as the feminine. Uh, up here in, um, uh, you know, northern New Jersey, New York, and the Brooklyn area, when it comes to the alt spirituality community, the first time at least I bumped into the notion of the goddess was through Terence McKenna, and he always harps on the goddess and the divine energy. And then later I picked up a book, much later I picked up a book called The Sacred Prostitute, which was by a Jungian analyst for Jungian analysts, and um, just seeing this rise, this return of like the female-oriented archetypes. And I'm sure you've sort of bumped into it as well. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's interesting um, in terms of, again, this is another area that I have, I have difficulty with because of the, uh, the contemplative tradition never lost that. Mm. So in terms of the influences that have been important, you know, in what I would, I've always been interested in studying since I was, a, you know, like a kid, um, it's always been kind of like related to like the troubadour tradition or, you know, it's always had like a, an aspect of kind of the, the divine feminine. So, um, you know, thinking about what kind of drivers there are, I think one of the things that 
is a flaw in my own research in that is that I usually only research stuff I'm, I'm interested in, <laughs> you know, or it's, you know what I mean? It's got to, in some ways, kind of like pique my curiosity. So um, I don't always have like the, the objective distance from it. So to see like the development of like, I mean, because there's obvious social drivers in the fact that, um, you know, we live in a culture that's very male dominated and it's, again, we live in a flawed culture. So there's kind of like a return to a balance, you know, that's necessary to bring those out, you know. And, and then the, with the popularization too, I think that a lot of the, the alternative spiritualities that came forward because of what the alternative culture was, um, you know, because if you think about the, the different things, you had the, you know, women's rights, you had gay rights, you had free love, you know, and you had free love back into like the 1800s, you know, or I'm sorry, like back into the forever. I mean, you know, there were Gnostic heresies, there were free love heresies. William Blake uh, was part of a, a Christian sect that, uh, you know, practiced at times sort of free love ideas. So, you know, that's always kind of been prevalent, but those those ideas those, that have always been kind of tied to the alternative uh, have been tied to that sense of, you know, what we would consider like a minority group in terms of power in society. That's always the alternative. You know, so it doesn't surprise me that the alternative spirituality and kind of a uh, society that consistently refers to God as him and that kind of stuff, um, you know, I mean, it would just make sense then that the alternative spirituality would be feminine. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and not... not... I think you're right in, in the sense that it's maybe that it's not so much alternative anymore, where now it's becoming mainstream, where it's becoming the, you know, the thing that is no longer alternative, although it's not what, you know, maybe most people consider the norm. Santa Muerte differs very strongly from a male interpretation of the Grim Reaper. Yeah, there's no, uh, I don't think there's any loving male Grim Reapers. Well, I guess actually, no, that's not true. Uh, Azazel, you've got, uh, is it Leila or Leila uh, Waddell, the um, necrophile down in Louisiana, I think. Wow. Um, well, she runs like a, like a death cult kind of thing. Um, but she's, she's real open about her practice. And she feels that she's got a relationship with the angel of death, who I think in her sense is like a, is a male presence, you know? So, but I mean, that obviously didn't catch on, but <laughs> I don't think we have like a huge, uh, at least not publicly. <laughs> so, um, but it definitely does. Yeah. Santa Muerte doesn't have the same kind of aggressive. Well, that's not, I don't know. Cause she, there is an aggressiveness to it. It's different, though. Yeah, it is suddenly different than a, a male, a male figure. Yeah, the the thought that came to my mind is, or at least the elements of the Grim Reaper as a male form, is that you have a kind of trickster persona and one who will play games of either chance or skill with you, and then at the very end will just sort of, you know, take you in a way that he cashes in with a sort of industrial indifference, and that even though Santa Muerte. Uh, the feminized version of this, you know, it does have a, a kind of neutrality and indifference in the sense that death comes to all. She seems to enter in a way where she's actually welcomed, where in the Grim Reaper, even if it's the skull on the desk of the thinker or the philosopher who reflects on the skull, um, subtly different. Uh, you know, the, uh, having the Grim Reaper man in the room with you is kind of a scary notion, but having a Grim Reaper woman in the room with you is, is it's strangely, hugely more calming and welcoming as a reality, I found, at least. And the other thing you brought up, which I didn't expect, was this talk about when uh, communing with Santa Muerte, <clears throat> this idea of silence, how there's a silence and there's vacant eyes, but yet there's a kind of transmission that's a non-transmission. Could you go into that? Yeah, I mean, that was, that was something that I, uh, I came to through just trying to, uh, you know, access the tradition because it's not, that none of the textual material is really effective for doing that. Um, 
And it's really something that you've kind of got to access. Because, I mean, if you look at the, the iconographies you have to work with, it's not, it's not as easily decodable, you know, as um, most iconographic symbolism. Because it's so simple in a lot of ways. So, um, you know, it, and in some ways it comes out of like a very commercial context. Um, but it gets such powerful, you know, kind of results from the devotees, you know, reactions in that. But um, I found that the only really effective way was to actually, you know, get down in with the iconography and actually kind of relate to it and, and work with it. And, uh, yeah, there's a, a kind of silence there, which Don Akeda talks about. Um, and it comes up, I think, in the, in the documentary that you're, uh, you referenced earlier. Um, where a guy's taking his kid to the Santa Muerte shrine, right? And the kid, you know, the kid looks at the the thing, and he, the guy's explaining, you know, this is this is my godmother, this is your godmother, and all that stuff. And the kid's reaction is like, she's got empty eyes, you know, she's got <laughs> eyes. So, um, but that struck me as really profound, you know, because again, it plays into the concept of neutrality and all this stuff. It's a really powerful symbol with it, you know, and that mm-hmm. silence as well. That was something that Don Akeda mentioned. Uh, which had been something that came out of, from me, when I was, was looking at the iconography, I'd kind of gotten that sense, and then Dona Keita said it as well, that was her interpretation of it, was the, um, the silence, but the silence that answers, you know, in a way that, you know, you've kind of talked about earlier, that goes beyond, you know, that, you know, it goes into that state of non-being, you know, yeah, uh, it, it's it was surprise. I think that's one of the other reasons why I was so struck by this by Santa Muerte was that there was an immediate dialogue in the idea that just one day you will look like this, one day you will be this. I'm this right now, but one day you will be this too. Right. Yeah, it had that you know Gnostic level of of really a kind of a profound acceptance right there. I mean, and I and the other thing that I wanted to mention about looking at that documentary footage and, and some of the newsreel footage I've been watching, all of this good stuff will be linked below, by the way, is that you... It, it's, it's so strangely comforting. It's, it, you know, just this idea and the vi- to see it, to see people talk to this death icon which is supposed to represent death the reality was something that i wasn't able to anticipate or prepare myself for the emotional reaction to it because you realize people will talk to all kinds of fairies they'll talk to aliens they'll talk to they'll channel aliens they'll talk to spirits they'll talk to you know you know they'll talk to the most obscure deities out there but very very few will talk to death, let alone an adorned death, one that, one that is actually, I mean, it's, it's going to sound weird to people who haven't spent time with this icon, but it becomes like profoundly beautiful in that, in, in its just utter reality, that one will be this, and that one's speaking with it right now. Yeah, and that, I, you know, you've got like a name like La Nina Bonita, like the beautiful girl, you know what I mean? Right. And, and they're serious about that. Like, you hear the the devotees are are very you know explicit about the idea of how beautiful she is, and oh, you know, look at this beautiful, powerful woman, you know, that is death, you know, and and just like lauding, you know, uh, just the beauty and the the profundity of it. And it's it is interesting because you know no matter what your association with it if you don't dismiss it you know and you actually spend time with the symbols uh it does it takes on that that realization you know and it, there is there's uh there's a meditation where you meditate on dissolving to a skeleton and then the skeleton disappears in light mm-hmm. uh, and that that is there is a meditation tradition based on that i don't know if it's taoist or buddhist or what you know what uh, tradition that comes out of, but uh, there is that there is that tradition, there is that meditation technique, and what's interesting is thing again, you know, with the uh, the idea that being confronted with this symbol of death, you are literally confronted with death, and then able to have that, 
relationship that goes back to the ideas of like the harrowing of hell and the prince going down to meet death and that in looking at the iconography like you described and you know this idea of that's going to be me and that kind of thing you have access to things very similar to the uh you know the skeleton meditation so um you know or there's uh there there are Taoist meditations like Taoist meditations on the skull uh, and that kind of stuff. So you have, within this folk tradition, access to some of the most sophisticated contemplative traditions. Right. Simply in the invitation, too, because a lot of the stuff that gets missed when, um, you know, let's say you go to a yoga class or something like that. Are you fully devoted in a loving way to yoga? Mm -hmm. Usually not. Not to yoga. Right. Maybe to getting fit, to getting healthy, to get whatever, but not to yoga. And if you go and you go into that yoga class and they're like, oh, meditate on this skull, it's you, it's whatever, uh, you don't have that, that kind of relationship. You may, you may access that, but it's not necessarily encouraged by the experience. But when you're faced with this figure and you don't dismiss it and you have that interaction with it, there's an invitation there to not worshiping devotion, but just a devotion of love to this thing that is always with you. You know, and it starts to speak on that level. And because of that, it doesn't have the artificial, artificiality that yoga has. And because it's so terrifying, because it's not necessarily an initially pleasant meditation or a pleasant uh, invitation to uh, conversation with an idea or, a med you know, a contemplation or a symbol set, um, because it has that unpleasantness, if you go through that, um, it has a level of engagement, again, that encourages a type of relationship that's not the same as if you just go to yoga class or if you, you know, learn meditation or do, you know, anything kind of self-willed, you know. Yeah, that's great because it can take us right into a psychedelic dialogue right there because you can't talk about transformation and yoga and enlightenment and meditation without bringing up a psychedelic component right there. Uh, it's definitely That's the new, is that the new the new psychedelic era we cannot discuss <laughs> any, any form of <laughs> way approaching altered states of consciousness unless we in some way address the psychedelic question because we live now in the psychedelic era because of Terence McKenna's CIA plot to cause the whole society to take trips. Yeah, that's what I heard. I heard that this was all a major con from the yeah. beginning to end. And that yep. and and that the whole like ayahuasca situation is a is a front. It's, it doesn't have to do with the real power. The CIA wants you to hallucinate yourself into yes. another dimension. It's another dimension. <laughs> that's, that's that's the rumor around the campfire right now. Is this, right? <laughs> the, yeah, around the uh, around the glowing digital campfire. That's uh, Jan Irving is spreading the word on the. Uh, the psychedelic, while at the same time supporting psychedelics, so you gotta, <laughs> there's some, there's some sort of amazing looping paradox there, which again is the nitpicky detail weirdness that you can kind of, you know, if you're a good discordian, you can ride the wave, you know, <laughs> got to be a real good discordian. <laughs> Oh, that's so wonderful. It's so wonderful. No, I, I meant like just bringing it up in the sense that, you know, yoga, zen, psychedelia, NASA, MLK, like uh, <laughs> all this stuff kind of showed up at almost the same time, at least for the American consciousness, you know. So it's it's not to say that, yeah, 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 no. But it's just another... It's just another, you know, facet to this thing is that you, you can't knock it. I mean, because even, 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 uh, even the Santa Morte Merite devotees, there's like classic to use marijuana as a incense and an offering and to blow it, you know, on the statue. So, I mean, I just wanted to bring that up. And that's another thing, too, that I think like people in the U.S. like just don't seem to react well to that. <laughs> it just doesn't. Yeah, I mean, like obviously unless like the people are smoking themselves, like, and then they kind of rejoice for it, but like they don't react well. I know there was one, there's one, uh, news program and I don't know it was like I think it was like a travel channel kind of thing and the guy went down to look at the Santa Muerte shrines and he happened to be a guy who really enjoyed cigars so as a journalist he was really kind of weirded out and not to end the whole Santa Muerte thing until he realized that he could be in a sanctuary 
smoking a cigar, blowing it on the statue, and that was considered a uh, devotional thing. And then he kind of got into it. He was kind of like, yeah, I like this, you know. Yeah, I would like that too. Sorry, you were saying? Oh, no, yeah. No, I mean, so they that was, uh, in some ways it can be a buy-in. But I think most people are kind of weirded out by that. You know, that your people are, especially like cigarettes and stuff like that, where, you know, people are smoking cigarettes and blowing it in their face. And uh, that's sharing the cigarette mm. with her. Mm. That's that's kind of a long tradition, too, though. Tobacco and the dead and that in a lot of Latin American traditions is very prevalent. So Yeah, I I, um, I really like that a lot. And I could see why they call her a cabrona, because she's like part of the people, part of the family. Like, you're not going to hide things from her. What you like, she likes, that kind of thing, you know. I mean, especially if it's going to be, you know, something like cigarettes. Right, yeah, exactly. Very down to earth, you know. Yeah, that's that's the other thing is the the discrimination um that we see the lack of discrimination that we see around Santa Muerte. Santa Muerte is embraced by people who identify as Catholics, by people who do not identify as Catholics, by um, you know, uh transgendered persons, uh, uh, prostitutes, um, you know, people, people in the sex industry, people in all kinds of people in, 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 you know, in places where when you approach the church as this person, you're turned away. Yeah. That's, that was the story of, uh, Arlie, who's the shrine holder in, uh, Queens. Right. Um, you know, she's trans, the Catholic, I think the priest actually told her during confession, why are you here? You don't belong here. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had some intense experiences where she was fearful of, uh, I think a friend had recommended that she uh, petition an icon of Santa Muerte or take a picture of Santa Muerte home with her or something. Mm -hmm. But she at first was afraid and then had a kind of profound experience with it. And now she's the, uh, you know, the guardian for the shrine in Queens. So... Um, it's definitely uh, trans, you know, gay, lesbian, bi, trans, definitely uh, huge, um, maybe not huge, I don't know. It's hard to tell because there's, there's really no statistics on the number of people who follow her. Mm. Uh, you know, that's definitely a prevalent part of the, the cult, at least in Mexico, you know, and probably, uh, well, I don't, you know. Well, she doesn't. She doesn't like push people away. You can be poor or rich or young or old or or whatever. But the whole idea is that death comes. Mother death will always come. The holy death will always come for you. So you don't have to worry. What you have to worry about is trying to have some kind of happy death. And and what does it mean for you to have a happy death? Right. Now that that brings us to I guess. Um, you know how you can't you can't not look at this this neutrality in miracle work that you find with Santa Muerte without kind of bumping into you know, the classic Latin maxim of temet nos or nosse know thyself and through this kind of wish magic you get a kind of mirror image of your soul because whatever you ask of Santa Muerte is going to directly reflect the quality of your consciousness, where you are as a being developed and so on, and, and your honesty, which we also see back with the marijuana and the cigarettes, is that this is a kind of honest deity that you don't have to play games with. You know, the, the, the uh, transaction seems pretty simple, is that if you do something for it, it'll do something for you, and you can be whatever you are because she is always arriving or always here. Right, but the with the with the saying like you can you will do something for her, a lot of that um, is pretty intense uh, in some sense where you know people promise sections of their skin to her, um, you know so uh, a lot of the tattoos that come out of the tradition are there for a prayer that was granted, so the person dedicated that portion of their flesh to Santa Muerte. Um, you know, so in that sense, the give and take is, you know, it can be pretty extreme. It can be pretty potent. I Boy. think that's the thing up here that, that another, you know, kind of lost in translation thing is the idea of, like, the level of what a gift to Santa Muerte could be. Well, you know, that's funny that it just, it just brings, it just brought something to my mind is that the more, the more one petitions and does these transactions with Santa Muerte and has positive results, the more 
holy death you will find in the world in the form of icons, uh, altars, images, t-shirts, statues, tattoos, you will, or, or poems, or what have you, or whatever it's going to be, is that the more Santa Muerte works, the more Santa Muerte will take over our world. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> that's a good, that's a very good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and the barometer is rather striking because from the statistics <laughs> I got from your colleague, it's something like uh, 10 million people, as I mentioned, from Chile to Canada. Yeah, and there's no way to tell um, really fully. I mean, the, the, the commercial stuff may be an indicator that botanicas are some some botanicas in LA and that are reporting up to fi like 50% of their income comes from Santa Muerte. Mm. So enough to keep open a store. I'm I'm about to recommend to um all my friends <laughs> who have uh <laughs> spiritually based shops that they should really stock up on Santa Muerte stuff cuz I mean, you know, I want to buy it. I want to you know, it's a very potent platform obviously. I mean, even just for me as like a totally novice gringo who just bumped into this thing thanks to you it's like wow the uh, okay going back to what i was going to say about the psychedelics is that the reason why i harped on it was because of the um trans the supposed right and i think it's legitimate right because you see like columbia university doing work with psilocybin and cancer patients facing death anxiety etc i think it was columbia it may have been the new york another new york institution but i know it was something very prestigious like that um, but this idea that, you know, when one uh, focuses a, on an icon or a deity or a goddess or something like that, um, generally, though not exclusively, I think we find that it has to do with, there's always this element, especially in religion and philosophy and whatnot, you know, of the transformation and that one has a relationship with an icon or a text, a scripture, a dharma, or what have you, where a relationship is being fostered and you know I'm in my own case when I was younger of course you know ravaged by hormones in my teens Buddhism made like a lot of sense because it was like oh you just calm down man you just chill out <laughs> you just look like this just be a dude man just be a dude but you know in later years of course like you get into it and so like the desire thing goes out the window but um, <laughs> the, you're like, yeah, no, let's ride this snake. Fuck it. But, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Excuse me. Excuse me. But um, <laughs> I wonder if I'll keep that in. But uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, th this, this, like, well, I, you know, for me personally, a as, as an icon, I can appreciate a figure like Christ in esoteric and, and, and mystical kind of sense. In the standard sort of Protestant or Catholic version, it, it kind of falls flat for me. But when you look at him as like, you know, the a magician archetype or something like that, it becomes more attractive. Or as one half of the alchemical process with Mary, then that becomes kind of attractive as well. But generally, it doesn't really do much for me. Icons don't really do it for me. They're kind of fun to experiment with, but they don't really do it for me. I don't feel them, like, transforming me. They're appealing for a while, and then I kind of drop them. Uh, with My initial reaction with Santa Muerte is, like, this could really do serious, good, transformative work. And that's why I brought up, like, the psychedelics, for example where it's, if you have a relationship with this thing, it feels like, and from the testimony I'm seeing coming out of the Spanish community, is that it, it, it looks like that, that this is working. It's working for them, and it's spreading. Uh, so, I mean, th that was something. Like, let's, can you talk about, like, the transformative element yeah. of associating with this thing? Well, and also I think, you know, it's interesting... Uh, when we see the uh, the iconography kind of come out in the commercial products that most people are seeing in the U.S., I mean, if you go on like Etsy or Amazon, T-shirts are a lot of like Katrina Calavera influence, Day of the Dead kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at the devotees pages on Facebook and that, uh, there's a ton of psychedelic artwork, like really weird collages, like really <laughs> like. <laughs> like birthday balloons and like <laughs> like confetti with like Santa Muerte and a birthday cake and stuff, you know, with like a thank you. 
it's you know and it was another thing where when i first saw it i was like the hell is this <laughs> you know look at that <laughs> what is this and then i was i started to look at it and i was like oh wow this is just somebody who's so moved that they went into photoshop or whatever they had maybe not even photoshop like you know whatever like paint right 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 and made this collage that they spent enough time to literally cut out the birthday cake and cut out the Santa Muerte statue picture and put it into this collage with a thank you on it and blast that to the public as a thank you with no signature or anything. But I mean, if you think about it, like that's, you know, the cutting and stuff like that, that's a good half hour to an hour or more work, depending on how good you are with those, you know, digital tools. And uh, to do that as a thank you to Santa Muerte, and to also have it be so innocent, you know, that it's like a birthday cake with some <laughs> balloons and then the Santa Muerte statue. Um, that was amazing to me. But the colors are, like, incredible. And, you know, they've she's, like, floating in space and there's, like, asteroids behind her. <laughs> it's, like, these really intense collages, all this, you know, different, really kind of psychedelic artwork, you know. Um, so she kind of has that aspect just in encountering her, you know, that very colorful, transformative, uh, very vibrant and lively. Yeah, I mean, you look at like the uh, Dona Cata's son makes wigs for the the thing. That's where one of the La Nina Bonita, the, the pretty girl, uh, is usually associated, um, at least around the Tapito area, with the Santa Muerte statues that have wigs on um, to make her pretty, mm. you know, so... <laughs> there's there's just this amazing aspect to it that I think, you know, if you think about putting a wig on a skeleton statue, there's something of a psychedelic experience there. Like, there's something kind of hallucinatory about that. Something, some kind of announcement. You know, the, the word psychedelic comes from, like, announcement of the mind. Right. You know, and right. when you're putting the wig on a skeleton, there's mind is announcing something. You know, like, there's an announcement from the psyche happening right there. So... I think, yeah, definitely just the devotions itself have kind of a, yeah, especially, I mean, for, you know, we keep, I don't even know how to term it. I, I keep saying U.S. or whatever. I mean, it's such a diverse, you know, there's really no generalities you can make, but sure. I would think that the majority of the people in the U.S. to put a wig on a skeleton for them would be somewhat hallucinatory <laughs> and strange to take them out of their normal state of being and give them some questions especially if they did it in love you know <laughs> that's, maybe that's the whole take home for this whole conversation when, when all said and done find yourself a skeleton put a wig on it love it and see what happens you know just if you want to go the Santa Muerte route that's probably the recommended way because there's some kind of traditional basis there that makes it a little bit safer and you're not going to get super weird with it but like uh Maybe just the wig and the skeleton would be enough for most people in the United States to get them out of the the general technological mass media digital ma like maze that they're in. You know. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. It was, it was, oh man. Thank you. Uh, one. What? Uh, the other thing on on just the. Uh, because I mean I imagine and you know we can skirt it if 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 you'd like but. I, I imagine for your case, since you're spending so much time on it, you're running the website um, Skeleton Saint, and you're working with uh, our Andrew Chestnut right now, and um, it looks like a lot of like uh, literature, material, and media could come out of this thing. That I mean, I I imagine my, I see myself spending time. I mean, there was times where I was kind of interested in like, well, let's see, like look at the Golden Dawn. Oh, let's take a look at the Lima. Let's take a look at you know, uh, you know, Peter Carroll and these kind of guys, what sort of methodologies and modalities and ideas are they playing with? And, you know, it just kind of feels like a tangled web of, you know, just stolen stuff. Not that that's a bad thing, not that it doesn't have effect, but when you, when I, you know, spent time looking at this Santa Muerte figure, it was just like you could feel, I could feel the change already mm -hmm. happening and, and the kind of the funniest example, like the most anecdotal example I can give is that I have a door in my room that creaks to high heaven and it's the most unnerving creak that you can hear 
You know, I've had people in my house like where their hair raises because I got a window open and my door creaks. <laughs> I mean, it's just bad. It's just this bad. And whenever it creaks, I always get up and close the door entirely. This is like a tick I've had for years. Ever since I've had this door in my life, I have been closing <laughs> it because it's just not a cool sound. It just feels really bad. Like whenever you hear, whenever you hear this door creak, you feel like anything could be on the other side, and it's totally legitimate. I don't care like what world you live in, but when you hear this creak, it feels like it's announcing, you know, the horror of the deep. You know, <laughs> like get ready. But as I'm looking, and I'm telling you, this is a tick. This is something I've always, always, always done. And uh, yet, last night, when I'm looking at the Santa Muerte, uh, Santa Muerte material, no kidding, my door creaks, and I let it go. And I let it go for like 20 minutes. And it creaks. And since I always close the door, it creaked in new ways. Because, <laughs> because I'm always like, shut up, close the door. But this time I like let it open because I was literally feeling the fear and feeling it melt just from looking at this uh, icon, the Santa Muerte. And as it was melting, I'm not even kidding, the door took on this new dynamic range of creaking that I previously had no idea was capable of. And it was much more sinister and horrible <laughs> sounding. Like it was just John Carpenter at the door, you know? Well, that's great though. Cause that's like, you know, uh, people pay to go to noise performances that probably aren't as evocative as that. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you through Santa Muerte were able to have an experience last night that was probably someone's like dream in Berlin or something, you know. You were you were able to experience a symphony that no one else has heard, the, a private performance by the elements, you know. Well, it's it's funny you mention it because I have there's been uh, I, I got really attached to my house here in New Jersey, uh, probably more so than I should. But for a while, um, there's a threat that like uh, everyone we're moving out, you know, that happens every couple of years, and it turns out we're not. And what I always wanted to do was create an, uh, an experimental album called House Music, where I'd put like a, a microphone in each room and record it for several hours, and then put together like a 18 hour long album called House Music. Like, this is what the basement sounds like. This is what my creaky door sounds like. Uh, <laughs> it might come out one day. <laughs> Yeah, inspired by Santa Muerte, you'll have to give a thanks in there. Um, oh, she'll be on the cover. She'll be on the cover <laughs> of a lot of my stuff right now. My fucking Facebook is already covered with it. I mean, that's why we're having this. No, that's what happened. Well, that was uh, that uh, Matt Staggs, the editor for Disinfo, when, <laughs> when uh, I think I was up in Chicago um, from Georgia, and um, I've been researching for, I think, two days straight. And it was just, I, I had... Um, I had a ton of stuff to do, and I was presenting somewhere, and I had to do a bunch of stuff. So I was, I was, <laughs> I was overstressed, like overtired, and I was researching Santa Muerte, and uh, you know I was struggling through the translations on the Spanish, and I like broke the point where I was like, I don't even care that I can't read Spanish. I'm just gonna read it, you know? Right. And so, um, was able to read more than I had been before when I was struggling with it, which was awesome. So I started doing more translations in that, and I started posting that, uh, you know, links to some of the stuff that I was finding, but I was posting it in Spanish and, like, posting quotes from uh, some of the prayers in that. And uh, Matt Staggs from Disinfo sent me a note, and he was like, are you okay? Like, are you going insane? Because it was all this, you know, it was, like, all these skeletons and, like, <laughs> figures, and then, like, you know, like, poems about love of the Grim Reaper and that, you know, like all this great stuff that I was finding. And Matt was like, I'm kind of concerned, like, <laughs> like what's going on? You know? <laughs> and I didn't know he was serious because I was excited, you know? So I started quoting back to him in Spanish and was excited. And then he got like really concerned. And uh, so, yeah, it can definitely, uh, it can take over, you know, definitely. Because it's so, it is so potent and it is, it is, once you get into it, I know I've been joking and stuff like that, but it's a beautiful tradition, you know, so it, I think, that, uh, yeah, I don't know, it definitely has that ability to kind of skirt in. Yeah, there was a joke earlier where David said that uh, he was, uh, that someone someone was concerned that maybe he drunk, drank the Santa Muerte Kool-Aid, and I told him I was already swimming in a pool of it, <laughs> so we should probably do an interview as soon as yeah. possible. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, it's and also you know if you got the editor of Disinfo asking you if you're okay, <laughs> as, as you're frantically posting, you know, tons of Santa Muerte information. Yeah, you know, and that's that's how people react to it, though. I mean, you know, people are un, people who you would not think are really unnerved by the whole thing, um, just because of the iconography and kind of how it's been portrayed in the media. People get real uncomfortable if they don't have a good explanation for it. You know, and something I was going to talk about with the potency, too, you had mentioned, um, you know, coming from, like, the Golden Dawn and uh, Chaos Magic and that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, again, something that I don't think, you know, it's possible here in the U.S. to access it still. I mean, there still are folk traditions that are alive in that, but most people who are looking at magic or the occult and that kind of thing aren't going to where the folk traditions exist. That's right. So, when you encounter Santa Muerte, you know, you encounter it in the U.S. through kind of like the occulture, so it seems like one thing, and then when you start to tap in deeper, it's not, you know, because it's actually a tradition. It's a faith tradition. It's a devotional tradition. This isn't a magical system or, a, you know, in the way that we would think of it, or, a, um, you know, this isn't somebody, like, going back to folklore and kind of building something. Like, this is literally a tradition that has grown from the ground up. You know, and for whatever influences folklore and, and that kind of stuff and academics and that have had on it, uh, it's very much a true folk tradition. Um, so when you encounter it, you're not just encountering an idea secondhand or thirdhand or whatever and kind of reworked for the society. Right. You're really encountering a living tradition that's still, and, and the really interesting thing about it um, is that it's still in development. So you're encountering a, you know, a living faith tradition that has come from the ground up, has come from very, very raw elements of, uh, you know, symbolism and that, very potent potentials, still growing, still developing, and inviting people to engage it, you know. So it's a different feeling than coming to, you know, something like uh, the Golden Dawn or, you know, Chaos Magic or something like that. Right, where those are kind of either they're established or there's a certain rules in play that one builds with or uses. This is really more like really dealing with an actual, and I love that we're bringing it up, devotional, where it's like, no, you have a devotional relationship with death as process. And it's been, it's it's this female version of it, which grants wishes and whatnot but that's what you're having a relationship with it makes me wonder this is and it's so decentralized which is one of the other reasons why i'm so excited about it is because it's truly avant-garde it's truly the avant-garde spirituality that i that i'm aware of at least right now at least it's far more avant-garde than you know and i'm not trying to knock people down but we were having a, a, a me and uh you know one of the one of the people who's associated with one of uh, Crowley's spiritual systems were joking about Peaches, the model or the actress who was coming out <laughs> and saying, like, I love the OTO, the OTO is great. And we were saying, like, well, she may have done more for Thelema than Crowley did right there in that moment. But just as kind of like a joke. But on the side here, the idea that, no, this isn't a system, this is you working with this entity. It's like entity work in, in, in a way, at least that's what I want to call it. So because of that, wh what do you have to say about any kind of texts or squares or, or prayers or things that are coming out? Because like you said, it's it's being born right now. And it might start to, it, it might, it might not be, but it might become less potent once it becomes organized in a way. I mean, I mean, because... Well, I, you know, it would be hard to see it becoming organized. Um, simply because right now, I mean, if you, if you look at, I don't think there'll ever be like an Orthodox church of Santa Muerte, mm. you know? Um, and if you look at the way that it's going right now in terms of, uh, church structure, uh, all the different sanctuaries and shrines and that, they all have different, very, very strong personalities that run them mm. and that take care of them. Um, and the, each shrine has its own history, and each of the people that are shrine holders uh, have their own very potent histories. So um, it's very much related to the communities that she comes up in, and the people who feel uh, devoted enough to create a shrine. 
and in their stories. You know, it's very because again the the iconography and symbolism and there's no there's no origin myth. There's no uh, backstory to it. There's no you know account of a birth and uh, you know whatever. There simply is Santa Muerte, and so uh, you know, and we can go back into historical and you know things that led into it. But as a tradition, there's no origin myth. You know, every shrine holder kind of has a different story for what Santa Muerte came from, and you know how that how the iconography developed. Uh, so, um, with that, I don't think there'll ever be a centralization. You know, it's a very almost, you know, and if you look at the the one time you had mentioned the bulldozing of the the shrines on the border, right? That came right after uh, or right around the time that um, David Romo who was the uh, the Archbishop of the Santa Muerte Church in Mexico, uh, he, he, got, he got okayed by the Mexican government. You know, he got the okay to be a, an official church. He got, like, the official sanction. And uh, he then proceeded to um, declare a holy war on the Catholic Church. Wow. And call out, like, the current president. Wow. The... the Bulldozing of those shrines, like in a way, was also a reaction to what was going on because of the centralization of Santa Muerte into this very contentious uh, thing. Whereas now, most of the shrine holders don't get that political with this stuff at all. So, um, even in terms of the Catholic Church and that, they're very careful about how they talk about things. So, um, and they don't really necessarily have rivalries. And they don't really necessarily have connections, uh, other than that they're all with you know they're all practicing uh, this devotion to Santa Muerte, and like I said, each of them have a different story. You know, um, La Madrina uh, Vargas, uh, who's holds the shrine that has the largest Santa Muerte statue. Um, her son was a devotee, and she was a devout Catholic. Um, her son was killed under questionable circumstances, and I think he had a hundred or so bullets in his body when they found him. Wow. Um, so she uh, vowed to Santa Muerte that although she was a faithful Catholic, if Santa Muerte granted her vengeance for her son's death, uh, that she would, uh, she would, you know, pay that back by running the shrine and keeping it going and by bringing Santa Muerte's name into the public. So... <coughs> couple months passed, she felt that that had been uh, fulfilled, and uh, so now today she's the shrine holder for that shrine, and she holds, you know, the mass, I don't know if she holds masses, but she holds services, uh, and, you know, has a, has a Facebook presence, and is, a, you know, a big uh, centralizing factor for that community, that community, uh, you know, she's always talking about community issues about uh, missing children's reports, um, you know, who needs help, what's going on. So she's very active in the community through the presence of Santa Muerte. Um, Dona Cata has the Santa Muerte shrine and she's known, uh, you know, people come to her for advice and stuff like that. Uh, so she's very much a community leader there. Um, so really what you see um, instead of centralization is you see kind of uh, communities centralizing around themselves around this the figure of Santa Muerte who's this neutral ground you know so hope that hopefully as it grows I mean the question is is because a lot of what I'm seeing is that uh, the second that it comes into the United States the commercial elements start to like really explode and then you also start to have conversations with really strong um, social faith traditions, you know, and like scenes and stuff like that that start to try to appropriate parts of it. So it'll be interesting to see what that, you know, as because even, you know, starting to get out to Europe and stuff like that, like the products, a lot of the products that are sold are made in China, you know, so there's a uh, presence in shops in like Hong Kong and that. Mm. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens when she goes to international and, uh, yeah, maybe loses some of the community-centeredness of the tradition. Yeah, there's two things I would like to mention from that, and one of them is uh, this was a hot article when it came out, but that there was a veve uh, in American Apparel in New York City, and for those of you who don't know, a veve 
is a traditional hoodoo sort of like symbol portal magical symbol thing and it was right in the middle of this in, in the it just, wasn't even voodoo. No, uh, Veve is voodoo. Uh, it's the the gate to the gods. That's like the god's signature. That's like one of the most sacred, like uh, you know, aspects of the ritual. And here so it that represents the loa. You know, right? The loa, exactly, exactly. And so here it is in the front display window of this New York City American Apparel store, and you know, you can't help but look at it and go like, you know, in my case, like ah. Oh, damn <laughs> you know it's just kind of like and it was the it was the i don't know the name of the loa yet but uh, the one that guarded the crossroads the crossroads loa Legua. yeah and here it is there uh the other thing that you just brought to mind which is what we're doing right now and i didn't realize it but this is the whole folk religion element of it is that it it is decentralized what happens you have an entity or a force or a practice or something, people engage it, and then they get together. And this is what all the documentary stuff I've been seeing is people get together and they start telling stories about what their experience with this thing was. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you think about a lot of, uh, yeah, I mean, most of the media out there is the anecdotes. And what you don't see in the U.S., the other thing that's interesting, too, you'd asked earlier about what, you know, resources and that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I can only think of a handful of books in English on her. Um, almost all of the materials in Spanish. So if you don't know Spanish or you're not willing to, like, dive in there and learn the Spanish, um, it, there's really not much out there in terms of the resources other than the statues and the visual, you know, the kind of... Uh, artistic, uh, visual stuff. Um, but when you do actually look at the Spanish material, a lot of it, um, there's a book called Legends of Santa Muerte, which are uh, anecdotes and stories around, sp around people's experiences, either fictional or real, uh, regarding their experiences with Santa Muerte. And a lot of the uh, devotion uh, to Santa Muerte magazine is based around people's stories. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's a huge part of this, this tradition and any folk tradition is, is telling those stories about the, what the gods have done or, in this instance, what, you know, Santa Muerte has done, what death has done for you. Yeah, in the same way, like, what do we do naturally, even if death isn't personified in this way as it is with Santa Muerte, but we tend to get together and talk about those who died, times where we almost died. What do we think about dying? And you can't help but think of, you know, I think it was uh, Cornell West talking about Plato. What is philosophy? Is philosophy is about how to have a good death. Right. Yeah. Yeah, holy death. Yeah, holy death, a good death, and all that. Um, well, we passed the three-hour mark, which I was hoping we would, and we might do this again. But, David, what's going on with you right now and the skeleton saint and liminal analytics and all this goodness? Uh, right now, I'm solidifying the project with Shannon Taggart, uh, where we're putting on those um, talks. We recently hosted Stanley Krippner to talk about his dream telepathy stuff, um, the experiments that he did in the 60s and 70s in Brooklyn. Um, and then we're solidifying that into a new project that's going to focus on material evidence of immaterial things. So how do you know, these kind of imaginal complexes appear in our world through material objects. And, uh, Go on. Sorry. And then two upcoming webinars. One is on uh, Psy, which I'm co-hosting with Craig Weiler for Evolver. And then another one on Sacred Geometry. It's going to be our second Sacred Geometry webinar uh, that I'm going to be co-hosting with uh, Scott Holes. So those are coming up and the details are not as of yet final but uh, those should be appearing on the Evolver website soon. How about you and our Andrew Chestnut and Santa Muerte? That's ongoing so we try to post as often as we can. Uh, my Twitter feed is usually filled up with it uh, with links and that. Uh, Most Holy Death on Twitter is the feed that we run to cover the Santa Muerte stuff um, and then Andrew Chestnut One is uh, Andrew's Twitter feed, um, and yeah, we're 
basically at this point, I mean, we're just kind of covering it as we can through the website and through articles on Huffington Post, um, and just trying to stay on top of the tradition and get people aware of it outside of the kind of uh, <laughs> sensationalist media or uh, you know negative media that's surrounding it, trying to get a more neutral viewpoint out there. And I got I got to personally thank you for that because uh, you know Santa Muerte was totally alien to me. It made no sense. I was averted to it. Um, and then after you know really diving into catching up with your work with it because I was curious about it and I didn't get it. Um, catching up with your work, I can't wait to read Andrew's book. I can't wait to check out the documentary and all this kind of stuff because it's it's. It's got my attention in a way that I didn't anticipate, and uh, you know I'm learning Spanish very slowly right now yeah. too. Right? No, it's, I think it's great. Yeah, it's a great opportunity. I try on Skeleton State to keep as much Spanish in there as I can, uh, just to encourage people to kind of engage that because we do live in America, and surprisingly, South America and Mexico are uh, American countries. <laughs> we should probably learn Spanish, you know? Um. Well, I, I noticed talking, uh, because I, I noticed that sort of talking or thinking about Santa Muerte in English sort of doesn't feel right, and usually <laughs> I'm not one of those people who are like, no, do it in the original language. Do it in the Latin, man. But... <laughs> uh, but <laughs> I'll talk about Santa Muerte in Spanish. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Saint Death doesn't really cover what she is, so yeah, it doesn't have the same kind of resonance. But it's, I mean, that's true though, because I mean, if you, the roots are different, you know, it's, some of the words are the same, but there's a different kind of intonation, there's a different feeling to it. When you learn different languages, you learn a different way of thinking. That's so, right. Uh, yeah. w while I was looking at it, I couldn't help but remember, I forgot who said it, maybe it was Oscar Wilde, but then there's always that quote. Every quote eventually gets attributed to Oscar Wilde, yeah. <laughs> which is when you have it may have been Goethe, but when you uh, when you know more than one language, you have more than one soul, and that and that felt really really true when I was speaking Spanish last night. Yeah, yeah exactly. When Spanish was coming to you through Santa Marte's uh, skeletal visage. Yeah, man. Well, it's beautiful stuff. One more thing too with the alchemy stuff. Let's do it. Uh, David M. Smith is coming out with a book, uh, Blazing Dew of Stars, and I think that if people are serious about alchemy, Kabbalah, contemplative work, uh, meditation, what have you, um, David M. Smith's work is, like Santa Muerte, part of a living tradition and very real. So. Um, you know, talking about alchemy earlier, if people are interested, his new book, Blazing Dew of Stars, uh, from what he's told me, it is the uh, first time that he's really opened up fully uh, as much as, as he has about um, his practice. So that book I can not highly recommend enough. Yeah, David's David's illustration is is so good. I I know that the instant I I feel kind of bad of this in retrospect, but I'm always wondering like, hey, that would look great on a T-shirt. But you know, <laughs> uh, I that was like my first message to him on Facebook <laughs> was like, can I put this on a T-shirt? And he was like, absolutely not, no way, yeah. man. And it, I think it was the Yahweh one where it's just Yahweh over and over and over <laughs> again. And it, it looks like, um, it's like the most beau, it's, his stuff is so beautiful. So of course, like that was, you know, my, <laughs> that was my introduction to him as it is with so many others, you know. Uh, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, no, those aren't, those aren't for t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> not for, not, not for commercial consumption like that, no. But, yeah, but see, yeah, you reacted to that because it is, I mean, they're, they're potent. His drawing is beautiful, uh, aesthetically. But, um, you know, when you actually read what is going on in those drawings and the, um, the concepts behind it and his practice and what he's doing to get to those drawings, uh, it's accessing a whole new level of understanding of this stuff. So, um, yeah, it's potent, potent stuff. I don't you know, it's not everybody's bag. It is, it is contemplative. It's not, you know, um, not necessarily practical stuff, but... You know, as a as a contemporary uh, contemplative practitioner, 
uh, his stuff is kind of. Oh, you there? Hello? Uh oh. It's, it's, Hello? Hey, 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 come on back. I think I got gotcha. you. <laughs> yeah, you said his stuff is kind of. Oh, his stuff is beyond compare, I would say, with anything else out there. You know, one last thing is that you brought to mind is that the big thing with Santa Muerte that I realized is that it is both contemplative and practical and immediate and visceral and existential and just happening. <laughs> I think that's, yeah, that is true. That's a good, uh, that's a good capstone, I think. It's just happening. Yeah, David, thank you. Thank you so much for your contribution, not just to this, but to what you proliferate on the internet and in text and whatnot. And I'm always looking for more of it, and I can't wait to do this again. Yeah, me too. Well, thank you, sir. And thank you for what you do and covering all that stuff. You've got quite a media thing going, too. So don't short sell that. That's all good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, to everyone, check out the description because. I'm going to try and make this thing as definitive as possible. We're going to drop a lot of links, and you may find a little George, what was it, Thurgood or Thurwell? Oh, yeah, you're the, yeah, the George Thurgood, yeah. yeah. You may find George Thurgood and a little Captain Beefheart down there, so enjoy it. I know it's not traditional um, Santa Muerte music, but <laughs> it's our spin on it. <laughs> All right, take care, Elliot. You too. Thanks. <laughs>